All right, good evening. It's 7.06. It's time for our um, monthly Bellbrook Sugar Creek School Board uh, meeting. This meeting is a meeting of the Board of Education in public for the purpose of conducting the school district's business. Uh, I'm in the boardroom and uh, the other members of the board are in their homes. We are social distancing uh, per the Ohio current regulations. And so, uh, Kevin Liming, will you please call the roll? Mr. Carpenter? Yes, here. Mrs. France? Here. Mrs. Long? Here. Mr. Price? Here. Mrs. Slothman? Here. All right. Please stand if you're able and join me. Uh, remove your hats and join me with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, and one nation under God, indivisible, and with liberty and justice for all. As a former scout leader, I hear, always hear in my head too as soon as we're done, so the salute can stop. <laughs> We're going to start with reports to the board, uh, district finances, Dr. Kozad and Mr. Liming. Turn it over to you. All right. Um, thank you. So, um, Mr. Liming and I are going to talk about our current financial situation. Um, as uh, all of you well know, that uh, the levy, um, the election did become official on uh, Tuesday. And the final vote was against 52%, uh, 3,338, and the four was 3,030. So about 308, uh, 18, 308 difference, yep, 308 difference uh, between that. Um, and, and obviously extremely uh, disappointed um, in the outcome there as we were continuing to wait and wait and wait. Uh, for those final results, even when they were initially announced on the uh, 28th. Uh, that was the second deadline, obviously, and then the 17th, obviously, on March 17th, was that original election day. So um, I, I would, it's probably safe to assume, and you never know, never know, uh, but safe to assume that um, the current COVID-19 situation had an impact on it and who knows what the impact was but of uh, moving that election back not having an in-person on the 17th uh, absentee balance by everybody which is the first time we've ever done it that way in ohio um the economy uh, in my opinion those are things that that definitely impacted um our election and so um with that situation, you know, we were really looking for that um, for that levy to be a lifeline for the school district because we're we're in a dire situation here with our finances, and um, so with those things, we're really starting to move away from um, educational based decisions on every decision to unfortunately more financial based decisions, and not that we didn't always take finances into consideration, but um, you know, the educational pieces, unfortunately, is taking a back uh, seat to the financial decisions. Um, and, and as we'll see in a little bit with, uh, with our board um, agenda and different pieces of that, we're unfortunately starting to lose some good staff and, you know, uh, because of that situation. And so um, as we had talked about um, at a February board meeting all the way back in February and in substances, subsequent situations and meetings with community meetings with the levy, um, levy community meetings and also at previous or at subsequent board meetings, we talked about the ramifications and consequences um, if the levy did not pass. And so um, the consequences are $2.5 million in reductions that we're going to be making over the next two years. We had to submit that information and that plan um, to the Ohio Department of Education. We're in fiscal precaution, and I would assume at some point, probably next fiscal year, we're going to be moving into the 
to a next uh, fiscal caution situation. Again, no word on that yet, but um, as you'll see in a little bit, um, the finances are, are they're dire. So before we, again, just to give people context here, um, I want to first review, because we've been making reductions, unfortunately, we've been making reductions here since 2018. And so just to, to make sure that people understand um, and have a better understanding of where we've been. And so uh, starting out with 2018, in that summer, we made $500,000 in reductions. That included uh, four teachers, part-time mechanic, reduced in budgets and building a technology, eliminated all day, every day, kindergarten scholarships. And we uh, uh, had uh, two full-time people go part-time, that position's payroll clerk and the manager of business. Um, after the, the May 2019 levy failure, we implemented phase one reductions, and that was about $813,000. And that included two teachers, um, two technology aides, the high school digital academy, one custodian, two part-time cafeteria aides, five full-time bus drivers since we implemented our um, ineligibility zone uh, for our, our school buildings, and additional reductions in budgets in building, technology, and athletics, and we postponed purchases of buses. Um, summer of 2019, Additionally, we made an additional $168,000 in reductions. We can continue to look for ways to reduce spending. Uh, we did not replace a high school Spanish teacher, and we didn't replace a third grade teacher. And so that particular, that grade level this school year had one less teacher than the other K to five, I'm sorry, one to five grade levels. And we also had an MOU with our uh, unions on a decrease in insurance benefits that saved us money. Um, additionally, um, we implemented phase two reductions in uh, November of 2019, and that was about a million dollars. And so that's actually for the next school year, for the 2020-21 school year. Um, the teacher, certified staff, administrators, and non-union staff are on a pay freeze and a step freeze this coming school year. So that hasn't even act that hasn't even uh, taken place yet, but that is an agreement we have in place, another MOU with our with our union. And we also eliminate three additional certified positions through attrition. So if you're adding those all up between 2018 and uh, going through phase two, that's over $2.3 million in reductions, 20 staff positions eliminated, and then 10 certified staff eliminated. Uh, we decided, uh, the board decided to not go for a levy in, in November, to be on November ballot, instead opting for the March 2020 um, election. And as I just mentioned a few minutes ago, that did not pass. So as we've stated um, numerous times at numerous meetings, the consequences of that, unfortunately, again, like I said earlier, we're moving away more from educationally based decisions to unfortunately financially based decisions. So phase three reductions were gonna happen regardless um, for 2021, again, that's the next school year. Elimination of the step slash gifted teacher at BCI, so that that uh, program is going away. The program of world languages at the middle school is going away. And then we're also reducing by high school English teacher at the at the high school. Um, and so that that is three additional positions and through and going to be filling a position next school year. Um, through an internal movement of a job share in the elementary level. Phase four reductions that are happening, um, this is personnel wise, are happening due to the levy failure. An additional high school social studies position will be eliminated at the high school. A high school um, science teacher position we're contracting out for uh, cost savings. The elementary art position, the elementary STEM position, uh, four bus driver positions. Um, due to our, uh, again, uh, reductions in our transportation, two full-time equivalent of our media specialists and librarians at the elementary level, and then um, 85 supplementals. 
Um, and I'll get back to the supplementals in a, in, a, in a second here. But the additional reductions at the district level are, because the levy didn't pass, reducing staff development. Um, again, we're right in the middle of year three of our strategic plan and project-based learning was a big piece of that. We had training last year. Um, so that's a, a big piece that's, that's not going to happen next year. Delay curriculum adoptions in math and science. So we have old materials in those areas, but we're gonna be delaying those curriculum adoptions. We're also gonna be non-renewing select electronic subscriptions. And you know, these decisions were made before we really went to on, you know, remote, remote learning, but that's gonna be even more and more challenging as we do that. And then also non-renewing our contract with our communications consultant, Allerton Hill, who uh, really has done a fantastic job, uh, you know, um, working on our social media, working on press releases, working with the district on a district communications plan. Um, and as you well know, we've had quite a few situations in the school year, you know, starting right from the beginning of the school year where that expertise, um, really has been invaluable, but um, we will not be renewing that contract. So if you're adding up those phase three and four reductions, that's, an, that's another $2.5 million in reductions. And that's a total of 33 positions eliminated. And um, 17 of those are certified staff members, so our, our teaching staff. Um, so if you're adding all those up, uh, $4.8 million in reductions that we have made and will be making through the next year based on uh, past reductions and those that are slated for next year. Um, just to go through some of the supplementals, and, and again, um, there's 85 supplementals. So let me be clear that on the supplementals, those, those things will not be happening this year. So we have teams being eliminated at the high school. For example, uh, freshman boys basketball, I'm just naming a few here, freshman boys basketball, um, reserve B volleyball, I'm sorry, reserve B volleyball, um, reserve lacrosse for both boys and girls, um, high school girls freshmen, reserve B soccer um, team, Reserve, uh, I'm sorry, and th so those are two, four, so those are six teams that will not be happening in the fall. And along with um, position cuts such as, or supplemental cuts such as Camp Kern Advisors, we're not going to Camp Kern next year. Um, the musical and play at the middle school will not be happening. Again, when these supplementals were cut, as we've, we've talked about, these supplementals are cut, um, those things unfortunately will not be happening and, and those are real unfortunate because as we look back on our careers in high school and middle school and, and um, in school that those really provide a well-rounded educational experience for our students and lifelong lessons um, that unfortunately will have to occur elsewhere. So that's just trying to be clear on the ramifications of this levy that, that did not pass. Um, and it really, you know, saddens me to, to see these cuts um, of having uh, students, you know, have gone through myself and my uh, um, and my own family going through. So a lot of these are are going to be really difficult to 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 deal with and challenge. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Kevin here. He's going to Kevin Lime. He's going to talk about state budget cuts. Um, yes, it's been it's been a challenging time in the treasurer's office. Also, obviously, um, just wanted to run you through what we've I've done in the last couple of weeks. Um, I had to prepare two different five year forecasts because the forecast needs to be filed with the state by May thirty first. That means it has to be completed, approved by the board, and submitted by myself. And two different ways we submit that to the ODE and uh, to Maveca also. So. Um, prepared the two forecasts, one with the levy passing and one with it failing, just so I could be ready to roll whichever way it went. Uh, so the day after I completed those two forecasts, we got the word that the state was cutting at $659,000 this fiscal year, which is, you know, we're at May, at that time, about May 15th when we found that out. And June 30 is the end of the fiscal year, so they're cutting 659000 in a month and a half. 
and I did some quick uh, calculations there, uh, they were going to deduct that from our state funding checks. Well, we don't get $659,000 in state funding checks in a month and a half. We don't get that much of state funding. So uh, then I had the question, do they just take us down to zero and leave it there? Or they, do they collect that out of next uh, fiscal year, the balance? And I found out that neither of those is what happens. They, they take us to zero. And then uh, they tell us that some of the deductions that couldn't be made from our state funding because we didn't have any money, we have to pay by check. <laughs> so we're mailing checks to F the wow. teachers' retirement and employees' retirement systems because we had been taken to zero in our state funding now. And we don't have the money to deduct it uh, as they do in the past. Uh, then I attended a webinar uh, because as, do as I'm doing a forecast, like, what do I put in there for, for next year for state funding? Do I assume cuts and if so what percentage and where am I starting from am I starting from where we've already been reduced to 659,000 to do further cuts or do I go back to the previous uh, amount uh, in the webinar uh, some members from OASBO the Ohio Association of School Business Officials that's my organization put it on and they uh, suggested that in year two which would be the 2021 fiscal year I do a 10 percent reduction as an estimate, and they don't know that for sure that that's what the state's gonna do. They're just uh, coming up with that, I guess, from discussions that they've had. 10% and start that from where we were this school year at the beginning before the $659,000 cut. So in my forecast, I've got that cut for the this month and a half, fiscal year 20, and in fiscal year 21, I, we, I put a, another $600,000 reduction in state funding. Uh, not sure that that's gonna happen, but that's the estimate I put in. Uh, and I think that's all I had about just that we also have a little bit of good news. We're expecting $160,000 to come in from the CARES Act, the federal program that uh, I forget what the, the acronym is there, but uh, we would be receiving that next fiscal year. So I built that into the, <clears throat> the uh, forecast also. Uh, then moving yeah, on. Oh, yeah, go ahead, Doug. And yeah, so just to add to that, so how did they get to what reductions were made for what school district? Again, our reduction was actually 11% of our state funding. That, 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 so when you take off how much you get from the state, it's a little, a little under $6 million. So they took about 659 this year. And so how did they base those? So they put them in tiers throughout the, the, uh, the, um, whole state. So not everybody got the same reduction. So, and I'm just going to read here from, uh, this is from uh, Ohio Budget and Management um, Director Kim Moniques, I, be I believe is her name. And she said, the formula is based on a per pupil approach that takes into account the ability of districts to fund programs with the ability to collect property taxes. Districts will see different reductions in funding based on local capacity, she said, with higher capacity districts taking higher per pupil reduction. She said to try to find a measure formula where they can ensure that those with the least capacity to adjust to a reduction had the least reduction applied. So if you remember back to our high performance team audit from, from earlier in the year, they talked about um, local tax effort and ability to pay. And so they're putting us, our community, not the school district, the community, in one of the highest communities of ability to pay and tax effort. And so that's why we got a proportionally different reduction because the state looks at our community and says that we have a high capacity, high ability to pay. Therefore, proportionally, that's why we saw a bigger, a bigger reduction um, compared to other districts. And so, the other piece of that is that CARES Act that Mr. Lyman was talking about is that's that's the inversely. So um, from the CARES Act from the federal level, so they base that on Title I funding. So those districts that are have much higher poverty, the higher the poverty, the more money they got from the CARES Act. So our poverty here is much lower compared to those. So because of that, we receive lower um, money from the CARES Act from the feds and we had a higher reduction from the state. So there's other districts around us that are inversely. They 
on this year, they made money on the CARES Act. When you put the CARES Act together along with their state reductions, they came out on the positive side. We came out and worked on the negative side. So again, that, that goes all back to ability to pay as a community and the wealth of property values in the community, not the wealth of the school districts, but the wealth of the property. School Board of Education, our representatives um, to the impacts of this, uh, because it's not, you know, it, it's pretty stunning that, you know, this decision is made a week after, I would venture to say probably most levies in the state failed as a function of the uh, concerns over the fiscal state of our country because of, of the COVID crisis. So for you know for the state to make this decision without debate, you know while they're sitting on a 2.4 billion dollar rainy day fund, and if this is not a rainy day, I don't know what it is. Uh, and so let's just make up a number. Uh, probably you know some percentages of, of levies failed that maybe would not have if people really were considering that their, their district was going to be further affected by these states or, uh, cuts that are going to come out of the blue a week later. So I think it was really derelict of our gov our state government, uh, and they should they should be held accountable for that. For the folks that are attending uh, this uh, town hall tonight virtually, I would highly encourage you, if you're so inclined, to express displeasure with the way our government has gone about this. Um, there's no way that they figured out they were going to do a school uh, school funding cut a week after this uh, election. They knew it was coming, and they did not breathe a word of it. And for some reason, they decided to target education when they're setting on a. And let me scale it down. Here's what I do for my kids. You know, 2.4 billion. That's a big number. So what is that? 300 million. It's a big number. Okay, if you got 24 dollars in the bank, we're talking about three bucks. You know, that they would have pulled out of the out of the account to spot education here, and they chose to do it, not to do it, to do it in a corner without any discussion. So I don't know how and who we should hold accountable. Uh, and not just just accept that this is okay. And I also wonder if it's necessarily a done deal. You know, if the governor really understands that this is, look, we pooched this big time by withholding this information until after people have made decisions that have, in some cases, catastrophic financial impacts on districts, perhaps he would reconsider. As we've seen throughout the pandemic, there are some things he put in place. At one point, was gonna demand everybody in public would wear masks and things like that, and he realized that was not acceptable. So potentially, you know, if, if there was enough uh, clear communication made to him and displeasure expressed, perhaps that could be reconsidered. Again, it isn't like there isn't money to be grabbed. There's 2.4 billion just sitting in the bank. And uh, yeah, it might rain next year too, but we know it's raining right now. And so uh, it's, it's not okay. <clears throat> So just to, to speak a little bit on that, so I did I did reach out to Senator Hackett and Representative Perales. Um, I did talk on the phone with Senator Hackett and express those same kind of concerns. Rep Representative Perales has not gotten back to me yet, so I'm going to give him another call. And actually, some of the superintendents and I in Greene County, we have a letter that we are crafting right now to not only just, you know, uh, to Governor DeWine, Senator Lehner, Senator Hackett, Representative Perales, and Representative Dean. Um, not only expressing our displeasure with the cuts, but then also the, the flip side of this is um, we're going to have additional expenses next year as we try to deal with coming back to school, whether that's hand sanitizer, gloves, masks, more bus routes, whatever, whatever it may be. There's going to be some additional costs, and they're going to expect us to do that, and still, and they cut our the projection is to, for them to cut us another 10 percent. Um, so that'll be a 1.3 million dollars. That they have essentially cut us in next fiscal year because let's be honest there our costs are pretty much fixed in may for the fiscal year fy20 this is really a reduction for next year um, but the other pieces that we're putting in that letter are um, asking for some reprieve on some mandates that okay you're going to cut this money from us we ask you to reconsider that but we also say what are some things that you can take away from us that will that will save us some money and you know some of those things are um you know for example of uh, the accountability measures for next year because who knows what next year is going to bring so should we be focused on state tests for next year or bringing everybody back safely so if those things aren't out there um uh, to be reconsidered 
The other piece is um, College Credit Plus, which mm -hmm. costs our district about a hundred grand, um, which I know in the whole scheme of things, you know, that is a lot of money, you know, and, and thirty million dollars, you know, but any little bit counts. That's you know, that's another thing that the schools pay, the K to twelve schools pay for college education. To reconsider that. If you want to offer that, that's fine, but not have the school district pay for that. So um, those those are just a few things in there. A lot more flexibility in the school level, a school level of, of asking for flexibility in hours and how we do um, uh, bringing kids back to school and licensure and getting rid of PD that's required for us at the state level that we get no funding for. Um, so those are just um, those are just a few things in that, and um, to, to let them know, along, Kevin, along your same lines, that we're not pleased and we need some extra help too. We need some extra help. If you can't help us financially, you can help us do some of this other stuff. Right. Thanks for the update. Well, those well, the letter that you send out, the the group of superintendents send out, is it something that citizens can also? Uh, Tag, tag along with and, and sign and send on their own as citizens? Sure, I can put that on our website and and send that out you know, via email also to our parents and do both. And if they wanna you know, uh, forward it on and have their you know, two cents in there uh, express their thoughts, I'll be more than happy to do sure. that. Sure. I just wanted to clarify too that uh, the state originally told us that the cut would be 3.7%. So uh, Doug and I got together and we calculated it to be in the vicinity of $200,000. And uh, then I remember Doug coming, either came in the office or called me or something, and he said, uh, guess what the total amount is? We just got it, I just found out, 659000 I said, well, that can't be right. They said 3.7%. It's an average of 3.7% statewide. Ours is 11, over 11%. So that that was quite a hit there, right? The, <laughs> after the levy fail and everything else, it's it's just another way to what I've been saying for a long time, and you guys are probably tired of hearing. But they've backed districts like ours totally into a corner financially, where all we have left is a levy of some kind. There's or you know massive cutbacks or a levy of some kind. There's nothing else you can do because the only other uh, source of of funding of any uh, uh, amount is state funding, and that's just uh, cut, you know, a lot. So it's, it's kind of frustrating at this point. Yeah, it's, it's real hard to budget for the FY20 year when we get a $659,000 cut in May. You know, when there's only two months left in your fiscal year, and right. we'll say, why don't you budget better? You can budget better than that. Mm -hmm. You didn't know this was coming. No, we didn't know a worldwide pandemic was coming and the economy wa was going to take a dive and we were going to, you know, have a $659,000 cut. Not a thought in anybody's head, you know, last year or three months ago, four months ago, you know, whatever, whatever it is. So it's real hard to plan when they come in at the last minute and, and make a big reduction like that. Well, it's obvious that the state isn't going to be a reliable source for us probably ever. You know, so we, we have to kind of take that plan, plan that they're not going to be reliable. Right. So you go back to, we brought in uh, Representative Cup in December to talk about the state funding proposal, state, you know, new funding proposal for students. And at that point, they still hadn't found any money for it. It was going to cost extra money. And certainly that is dead in the water now because that's more, uh, that'd be additional funding, not a cut in funding. So um, again, it comes back to, Locally, what kind of school district do you want at locally, local control, and be able to support that at the local level because the only the only things that you can control are, are local level. You can't control what's going on at the state level. Right. Okay. Kevin, you want to move on there? Or anything else? Sure. Any other questions? Uh, comments? Okay. okay Did having uh, the, um, with the e-learning and kids being students learning at home, did that cost us money or save us money or how did that work out or how is it working out? That was an excellent transition into what I'm just getting ready to say. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Um, and my dog barking at the door. I'm sorry. 
Well, uh, <laughs> due to the, to the COVID virus, uh, I've been asked several times what kind of a financial impact did that have, positive or negative, on the district. Uh, mm -hmm. I just want to tell you, I didn't want to put this document out uh, directly to you all because some of the numbers I have here, well, really all of them are best guess estimates. Uh, so I'm just going to tell you what I've got. Uh, some of the extra expenses of COVID, uh, we had to return uh, $27,000 of all day, every day kindergarten tuition. Uh, we had to return $21,350 of preschool tuition because we didn't have the program. Uh, I'm not sure what the amount is on this one, but uh, obviously if we're not having sports in the spring, we can't have uh, participation fees. So those, uh, and those are hard to calculate because part of that goes to the athletic department, part of the general fund, and it depends on how many athletes we're going to go out for each sport. So it's, I couldn't calculate that one. Uh, I anticipate our lunchroom is going to have maybe a, not a big one, but maybe a $25,000 deficit at the end of the year, uh, which the general fund will have to cover because we have no uh, payment for lunches uh, and we have no federal and state reimbursement for the two months. And we still have to pay. So uh, our, our lunchroom company uh, laid off all their employees that work in our district, except for just a couple and the, uh, and the director, and we have to pay uh, the portion of their salary for these couple months. On the positive side, um, we're not paying substitute teachers for the, and, and you know, the truth is in school districts, a lot of times, uh, April, May, there are a lot of substitute situations there. Um, we were able to <coughs> trash pick up, that's a small one, but that was some savings. Um, we're going to ask you uh, here later in the meeting, I believe, to prove uh, an MOU that uh, Doug will address where we will not be paying the second half of the spring supplemental um, paychecks. Although the Ohio Revised Code in, in all areas says that we have to pay all contracted employees, staff during the pandemic, if you get a memorandum of understanding with your uh, association uh, in a certain area, you don't have to do that. And they agreed to do that with the uh, last payment on supplemental contracts. Um, we're not operating school buses. That's a, a big one. We uh, don't have to pay sub bus drivers or for extra trips. Uh, there's no wear and tear on the buses. But um, on the other end, we do get some reimbursement typically for transportation, and that won't be coming here from the state. But that's a that's a win. And then uh, lower utility costs, uh, electricity, heat, water, and sewer. We saved about thirty-two thousand dollars there. Uh, by estimate, and about sixty-four thousand on the supplementals, not paying that second half there, and about sixty-eight thousand on the sub teachers that we're not paying when we include their retirement into that, and that includes uh, some of those that are long-term subs. Of course, there will be some coming off of that uh, sub teacher savings because a lot of them are filing unemployment, and uh, it's not very much; you just get a small portion. But we do have uh, some money that we'll have to pay out there. Yeah. So overall, though, we're 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 going to be ahead. Uh, with if pending approval of the supplemental is not being paid for the second half, uh, somewhere in the vicinity of about ninety thousand dollars, probably that uh, by my calculation uh, we would save by not having school these last two months. Uh, with uh, just off the top of my head, though, with estimated numbers, because there are probably other areas that were being uh, savings or expenses that I, I didn't come up with. But on those I mentioned, it's about ninety thousand uh, dollars. One thing that uh, I wanted to mention too, though, we'll probably talk about a little later, but we had predicted a five percent increase in medical insurance this year because we got twenty four percent last year, and it came out to be seven and a half. <clears throat> so that's another thing that we got to think about too. But any questions about the financial effects of the of the COVID and uh, being out of uh, doing the remote learning for two months? <clears throat> Uh, one thing, just to clarify, I think obviously people that have children know, people that don't uh, or don't care to take the time to, to find out about it, maybe don't know, but uh, the teachers were paid during this period of time, but it's also because they were working during this time, correct? Yes. Thank you. Correct. Every, all staff was working, whether it was done remotely, whether it was done uh, providing extra professional development, or towards the end of the school year here, year here of helping uh, pack up classrooms, helping to hand out, uh, you know, belongings of students, collecting uh, belongings from students, or cleaning, or painting, 
Um, so we had our, our staff, um, most of that were, were transportation special needs supervisor, or special need um, special needs assistants um, that were that were doing that work and staying busy throughout this whole time. So no one was sitting home and um, getting a paycheck without doing anything. Everybody was working remotely, or everybody was working in person. So the real focus uh, of my question was the teachers. Where the was the teachers, yeah. and, and they were instructing. They were providing lessons Definitely. for their students they were not just drawing a check while they were sitting on definitely um, that right with also with the understanding that the Ohio revised code requires a, uh, all school districts to pay those people so we didn't have a choice to not pay them unless we try to get the association to agree to not be paid or something like that uh, that might have happened somewhere but not here um, any other questions about that before we move on to the next one okay um, I want to review the five-year forecast at this point, and then uh, a few minutes later, we'll uh, talk about approval. Uh, so the any discussion you have now, if you have a discussion about that, did you receive that by email? Hopefully everyone did. I sent, I sent it. Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Good. Okay. Uh, yes. if, you want to, if you want to look at that now, if you can pull that up. Um, and there we go. Good. Boardroom is presenting. <laughs> okay, that uh, there you have the assumptions. Do you have the uh, actual spreadsheet itself, Josh? The other part of the um, forecast. I know it's pretty small, probably. Okay, and then and then keep uh, flipping down to the numbers. If you scroll down, yep, there you go. There we go. Until you know, we get to the numbers. Yeah, okay, right there. Uh, can't see that real well, but uh, I wanted to refer to a couple of these lines um, and explain a little bit about what we did because, like I always say, we have to make some kind of assumptions in order to do a forecast, even though we don't know for sure what's going to happen in some of these areas. The first line there, 1.01. .01, property tax receipts. Uh, you can follow that over and see that uh, between from 2020 on to 2024, um, we had uh, this year, 2020, received uh, $377,000 more than we estimated to receive in uh, real estate property taxes. So that was a good thing. Um, however, I have built into next year uh, $150,000 less uh, anticipating some delinquencies or possibly loss of property values due to the levy failure. Uh, I did present a one, uh, provide a 1% increase all the way out there to just as an estimate, but I did reduce uh, fiscal year 2021 uh, some. And then I, I uh, let's see, there are, other, there are other changes in the notes that I made to that one, but uh, that basically that's what I did with that. Hey, Kevin, the the with the 377,000 early, uh, people should understand that was a result of the tax code change in 2018 where people would lose, we got a cap on their deduction for uh, uh, property taxes, right? On So they were capped, I believe, at 10,000. So some people would choose to go ahead and pay ahead their property taxes so they could take advantage of that deduction before the tax law changed, right? So that's that's just a one-time bump, correct? Well, well, what I, uh, that's actually true, but that wasn't what I was referring to. Uh, that the effect of what you just talked about there, Kevin, was in fiscal year 18 and 19. That's why we went from 17 to 18, back to 17. Uh, fiscal year 18 is when everyone paid, and fiscal year 19 is when they already had paid for the whole year, <laughs> that one half, and didn't uh, pay on it. But the increase, the 377000 was was due to uh, – additional uh, new construction in the district the great okay. portion of it, some of it a smaller portion was due to a reappraisal on the inside millage but that that was a great. very small amount thank you uh, and th then on line the big one to look at uh, probably the second most important line to look at is 1.035 i think the fourth row there mm -hmm. uh, state grants and aid that's our state funding and uh, it's interesting how it's uh, moved from 6 million to 6.2 to 6.2 to 5.7 because of our cut, and then about 5.7 again because of 
Um, we're actually cutting in fiscal year 21 from what we got in fiscal year 19. <laughs> kind of right. And then they told us the best thing to do the last three years for state funding is just put them back to where they were, where you were planning on them being for fiscal year 20 before this last cut and leave them as a freeze those three years. So that's, that's what I did. I know districts all over the state are doing uh, a multitude of different things with their state funding those last four years because nothing's set on those. Then on 1.04, that is uh, in fiscal year 21, I included the CARES Act money, the $173,000 on uh, that fifth row there, 1.04 uh, in fiscal year 21. That shows the CARES Act money. Um, okay. I wanted to so, show Kevin, so Kevin, just to go back to that, you know, that reduction from the state. So, you know, in, in fiscal year 20 and fiscal year 21, that's about $1.3 million. So if you just go 600,000 times five years, that's $3 million over the five-year forecast. If they continued on that 10% reduction, they said not to, but who knows what it's going to be. So that's a, that could be $3 million less over a five-year forecast that we could be receiving, but we don't know that information yet. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, then on the expenditure side, down to uh, row 3.01, personal services, that is our salaries line. And you can see due to the cutbacks uh, that we're making for the next two years, um, how we change there from 17.2 to 16.4 to 17.3. The reason that goes back up is still have pay raises built into those last three years. Um, and that's why they go back up there. But uh, this is where we would see the bulk of the two and a half million dollar reduction uh, for phase four cuts would be on 3.01 and 3.02 retirement and benefits for those people that have been not replaced through attrition or rift. Mm -hmm. uh, so that and some of the substitute uh, money also is figured in here for fiscal year 2020. The subs that aren't being paid for the year we're just now finishing. Uh, let's see if there's anything else here I wanted to note. Um, I just would say the big line uh, is the is 7.02. If you could scroll down just a little bit further there, Josh, 7.02, it says uh, cash balance June 30th. So this, this number on that line is our balance in the general fund at the end of each fiscal year. So that's the last day of the fiscal year. What's our balance? Um, this year, we're predicting that in about six weeks, we'll finish with $2.75 million. Uh, it will go down a little bit next year, even though we make all those cuts. We'll go down to 2.08. And then that third year, 414000 and $2.7 million in the red, $7.1 million in the red. This is assuming, obviously, no levy passage and no additional it, – it's just uh, talking about – where we are right now. No additional cutbacks over phase four, no levy passage. That's where we end up by what we know right now in our estimate. Uh, any questions about any of this stuff? Uh, we are required to do another one, you know, uh, uh, by November 30th, an update. Um, and so um, who knows what can happen between now and then. By that point, we probably know what the what's going to happen for, well, we will know what's going to happen for fiscal year 21 and state funding. We'll know uh, if the board is, is planning to go for any other kind of revenue increases and, uh, you know, negotiations will be coming before long. So <laughs> a lot yeah. of things to look at here. So really in about six weeks, um, fiscal year 2020 is going to be over. What that moves you know, the forecast year is going to end up being 2025 at the end. And we're going to be back in into uh, 11. <laughs> that, that scenario where the, the state is coming to say, what are you going to do to make, you know, to get you out of the red in column three? That's right. Column three is the one, the one that's 414,000 right now is the one that they yeah. have views to see whether or not we're in fiscal caution. So we probably, I, well, we will be. There's nothing. There's anything we can do to come up with that uh, money that quickly okay. in two months. <laughs> right. So, uh, you know, I, 
I don't know. Yeah, again, this it's, is it's kind of you know, this is with the reductions in place and bringing none of the reductions back. But we need to remember that too. That this is none of the reductions are returning based on this five-year forecast. So, anytime you would ever bring back something that we would do, it's going to be a cumulative effect on that on the negative side. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Um, one thing I forgot to say earlier. Uh, when Dr. Kozad reviewed all the cutbacks we had made, that they totaled 4.8 million, uh, just did a quick calculation. That's about 16% of our entire budget at that at that time. The 30 million dollar budget and cutting back 4.8 million of it's about 16% um, that we will have now made. <laughs> uh, and and about 10% of our staff. Correct. Right. Little over ten yeah. percent. Yep. And we are uh, we are the largest employer in the school district. Uh, the last time I checked, so um, mm -hmm. that had a direct local effect in some ways, depending on how many of those people are residents and how many aren't. Sure. Um, well, that's a that's a hit to the community as a whole, not yeah, just right. the district. Definitely. Yep. Yes. Uh, so. Um, I think that's yep. all I can present unless you have any other questions about that. No, thank you very much. All right. It's dismal news, but thank you. Yeah. So as we're, um, you know, so the district finances here, um, again, as you see that situation with our five-year forecast and the, um, you know, reductions from the state, and who knows if there's going to be additional reductions at some point or, you know, just a wild card out there. Um, so, you know, as we look to, is there, and I hate to even say this because we have, uh, like we, we like we just reviewed of the, the amount of money and the number of staff members and percent, but are there, you know, additional, uh, you know, additional reductions or ways to, of cost savings that we can explore now rather than later. And I hate to even say that and bring it up, but you know, with the levy failure and then the, um, really it's gonna be $1.3 million in state reductions, it just becomes an even tighter situation. You just can't end the fiscal year at $400,000 because it's gonna ebb and flow throughout the year. Um, and when you're looking at a $30 million budget, $400,000 is not a lot of money. You know, that's a, a, a boiler failure away from being in the red. You know, we have huge boilers that are probably, you get a new one, half, half a million, $750,000. And so you have something like that, and it's an emergency that you have to do, then you're, you know, you're, you're, um, you're breaking either in the red just two years out. So, um, you know, is there, and again, this is just conversation to have here. I don't, you know, necessarily um, need specific feedback. Feedback is welcome, but just as there are additional reductions, you know, anytime you talk additional reductions, they are gonna lean to even bigger class sizes, less electives being offered, um, less sports or extracurriculars being offered, um, moving closer and closer to state minimums, and getting away from a well-rounded education, um, more busing. Even though we're at a busing, we're at, we're at the state minimum at BCI in the middle school and the high school. So it's a two million, two, two mile state minimum at the middle school and BCI. We're already there with phase four reductions. And no high school busing for next year. That was in the phase four reduction. So that's state minimums. Stephen Bell, we're almost at state minimums, but we aren't quite there. So exploring other things. The other. The other thing that I would like to, to explore and to discuss out here is, as we look towards next year, is there a way to, um, you know, the uncertainty, and we'll get to the uncertainty in just a minute here with our remote learning presentation, but um, as we're looking at uh, possible ways to be proactive in, in reducing costs even further is, um, looking at our all day, every day kindergarten. Right now, we do charge tuition for that all day, every day kindergarten, and we increased our uh, tuition this year from the uh, up about nine hundred dollars per kid per year to try to get closer to a even balance there. 
We're not quite there yet. We're actually uh, $40,000 in the red um, on the negative side on how much tuition we, we collect and how much we pay teachers. And so then you add into if we would do the same practice as last year, where if we were out for a month, we would be reimbursing that tuition. And the reimbursement of the tuition is right now we have four classrooms that are all day, everyday kindergarten. It's $10,000 a month that in uh, tuition reimbursement, to tuition that we would lose if we're out for a month next year or we're out for two months. Who knows what it's going to be for next year? So, um, is this something that we would want to consider of suspending all day, every day, kindergarten for next year, not eliminating it, but suspending it for a year just because of, you know, our increased financial situation from our reductions from the state and also the uncertainty of losing even more money um, because of those, um, because of those reimbursements or refunds, which rec better word of refund. So thoughts on any of that? You know, another piece is that should we explore, and again, this goes back to that performance audit, should we explore selling some of our land or Sugar Creek Elementary? You know, those are, those are one-time sales, but they would give us some money. You know, that, that needs to be a decision that we're making, or need to be not making, but thinking about strongly in the near future. Is that something we want to explore also? So comments and thoughts about that. About all day, every day, kindergarten, or about additional reductions, or, or thoughts in general. Well, the the all day, every day, if if we have the potential of losing uh, forty thousand um, dollars a month, forty thousand. Yeah. If we uh, have four classrooms, yeah, so forty thousand dollars at the beginning of the year, starting out. Right. We're already in forty thousand dollars in the red. We tried to get a little. To that, but yeah, if we had four classrooms, it's ten thousand dollars per classroom. Correct. I'm sorry. Right. To I mean, that eats away our our four hundred and fourteen that we've got as our reserve in two years. I mean, then it leaves us with almost nothing if if the school year um, ends up being remote learning most of the time. I mean, uh, we're not. And if our finances were good, I'd say let's let's consider that risk. But I mean, I think we have to really carefully consider whether we can accommodate risk or do we need to be risk averse. I mean, I I don't I certainly don't want to get rid of all day every day kindergarten. I'd like I'd like to see us really go in the opposite direction so that we can go all day every day as the norm. But um, financially, I've, that would it's, we certainly can't go the other direction now. I agree with David. I I really hate to see all day every day go away. Um, I was one. Of, I was the one of the ones that really pushed for that. Right. I was hoping that it would grow until we had the entire kindergarten as all day every day. But at this point, we can't, this is where we get down to the education question versus the financial question. Right. And we can't, we can't afford to do anything that we know is going to be a loss because we just, we have to protect what we have. And this is one of those things that I really hate to see happen because I think it's, it's good for the kids and it's, it's good sure. to have so many of them on the same path, same path, shall we say. Right. We have a we have a reduced number of students enrolled for all day every day so far for next year, um, and it, at least we we would we could consider not having four sections whether we consider two or three might be might be an option to consider but then how there's also the possibility that if if we are not if we're social distancing and so forth are we anticipate that but kindergarten parents aren't going to be as willing to send their kids off to school they'll say you know i'm going to wait i'm going to send them 
next year or I'm going to do some of that instruction at home. I, I, mean, I don't know. Well, I don't know what the likelihood of that is. And, and Mary, your experience is, has some input on that. Yeah, I would. Um, I, things are so up in the air for next year. I mean, we have no idea what's going to be happening. Uh, we can make we can make guesses, but if we don't have any way to say to parents, this is exactly what we're going to do because it can change daily. As we've all been for the last month, everything changes every day. So I think we really need to um, carefully look at this and do what we can, but it's hard. Just to clarify for me here, the loss only becomes a reality if we don't have school next year, right? So it's not a concern if we have a normal, uh, you know, school year. Then that, the, the problem comes in is if we don't, and then we don't collect the tuition any longer, and therefore we start running a, a deficit. Is that is that the gist of it? It's partially yeah. partially correct. So right now, and, and David said earlier, we have a low enrollment in kindergarten. So right now, in all day everyday kindergarten, we have about 86 students in all day everyday kindergarten, um, and we have four teachers in that um, in that area, and we would take up to 25 kids in a class, so up to 100 kids potentially. But in the other four sections of every other day kindergarten, our purple and gold, we have about 10 kids in each of those four sections. So obviously that is extremely low. We're at about 127, 128 right now in kindergarten register, kindergarten registration. And we're normally up to 150, 160 by now. In the past couple of years, we've been at about 180 or so, somewhere in that range by the time school starts. So I think there's a lot of parents out there not only around here, but around the state at this point that are apprehensive of sending their kindergartners to, to school, that they may wait a year. Um, but if we if we go ahead with it right now, um, and we would need 14 additional students in all day, every day, if we get that, then starting out, we would be losing, we would still be losing $40,000 from the beginning because how much tuition we would collect and how much those salaries cost, we're $40,000 in the red already if you take in consideration for those four teachers. So again, we were trying to get closer, inching our way closer to breaking even on that. Um, but then if there's a, if we're off for a month or two months, then it's $10,000 per classroom per month that we would be losing. Do we need to make a decision about this tonight? We don't necessarily need to make it tonight, but we need to make it soon, real soon, because um if we are going to uh, suspend all day every day kindergarten we need to give parents enough time to find a if they still want all day every day to find another option for them in the fall and those options are probably fairly limited right now just because of, of daycares and limited numbers and so forth um so the sooner we can let them know the better and also from a personal perspective, if we have to move people around um, to fill open spots, we need to know that sooner rather than later also. Sure. Um, I agree with that, but I don't think tonight is the night for a decision on that. Yeah, as, I, I would agree. I think that, that. Yeah, I'm sorry. That's definitely something we can, you know, we can uh, visit again at the June board meeting, I would say by that time. We really need to have a solid decision in place by that, you know, after that meeting or at that meeting, just because of personnel decisions and so forth. Again, we are we are um, surveying our parents and seeing what their thoughts are about this year and what their thoughts are about next year. So trying to get gather that information also. So that's just something we need to have. Don't need to make it tonight, but we need to make it sooner rather than later. Okay. So no children would go every day, all day. It would just be the gold and um, purple class schedule. Yeah. So would by chance children with IEPs be eligible for all day, every day? Because what I'm thinking about is for the kids I work with, um, the consistency of the all day, every day is pretty imperative. So would that make any difference for any kids? 
Well, so those are those are individual decisions for each IEP student. What we typically would do with a student that would be a, a high need student with that. Again, not every every situation is individually, but we would we would mostly put them in the purple gold rather than an all day. So they would get the same thing twice. If that makes sense. So they would still go every day. That could be a, I mean, that would have to be an individual IEP decision and the data would have to support that. But those are, that's what we typically lean to right now in our current situation rather than doing all day, every day. They do purple gold so they can get it twice. That kind of makes me feel a little bit better if that's an option for some students. Um, yeah. Probably with the same teacher. Yep. That would be some consistency too. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah the challenge with the consistency piece would be a real challenge if we do some type of hybrid next year or if we, and we're going to get to that in a minute here, but um, that if you're only going, because purple and gold is only half time kindergarten, it's just all day, every other day essentially, rather than half a day every day. So if you go to some type of hybrid learning, they would only get quarter of it rather than half of it during that time, if that makes sense. No, what Just do like, you mean? Say it so again. We, because they're only half time. Kindergartners are only half time right now. Right. So if they only go half of half time, that would be a quarter of the time in school. So if next year, if we went to some type of model where kids oh. only come half the time, in grades one to 12, you know, that's, that's 50% of 100%. Kindergartners, it's 50% of 50%, which is 25%. Yeah, yeah. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. we, we, I will, we will put this back on the agenda for discussion in June, if that sounds good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. Yes, please. Okay. Um, okay. We want to transition to um, remote learning review of 2019-20 and preview for next year. Are any other questions on the finance district finances? Not this time. Okay. You know, I know that, and I'm looking at the time here. That was a pretty lengthy discussion. <laughs> that we had on district finances, but you know, that's where we're at. I mean, that's where we're at with things. We have some serious discussions and serious decisions that we have to make and, and we need to have all the information. So I'll try to make this a little quicker on the remote learning. Um, you know, just to give you a little review, um, today is the, um, the last official day of school for 2019-20. I know with all the weirdness of schedules and whatever, it doesn't maybe quite feel like that for some people, but today is the last day for students. Tomorrow is the last day for teachers. Um, so if you think back, March 12th was the day that the state announced that we were gonna go to um, remote learning. Um, and again, we don't find out at school districts information any sooner than the public. So we were watching the conference on March 12th with DeWine and that's when we found out too. So we don't get any inside information on that. And so that's a Thursday. By Tuesday of the next week, <coughs> we were up and, and ready to go for remote learning. And so the key pieces of that, there's a couple key pieces of that, is that we, um, we've been using Google Classroom for a few years, and we had really stepped it up this year, uh, pushing all teachers to use that in varying levels of, of expertise and, and, and degrees. But I think that was a critical piece of a quick turnaround. And the other critical piece is our commitment a few years ago of essentially going one-to-one -one with devices. Just think if that we were not one-to-one -one with devices, where we would be at. There are school districts around the state yeah. that are not one-to-one. -one, and to do remote learning without a device is, is a huge challenge. Not a challenge with doing it with the computer, but just imagine without. Yeah. So um, we had a PD day on March 16th. Kids came to remote learning on March 17th, and we hit the ground running with daily interactions and, and 
uh, Google Meets and Screencastifies and using digital um, app applications and so forth. And we did that for two weeks, and then we had spring break. So over those two weeks, we gathered feedback from or from from teachers, from parents, um, anecdotally, and we made some adjustments that the daily interaction, the schedule that we were on, you got to remember back to March, middle of March, based on the situation we were at, is that a lot of uncertainty, a lot of people at home, first time that they really are helping their kids at that level on learning. There was a lot of stress. People are still trying to work, still trying to help their kids learn and learn. And so there's a lot of adjustments. So after spring break, we came back with a different plan that we were going to divide it up. We were going to do two days, Monday and Thursday of something, of, of, of classes, and then different classes on Tuesday and Friday. And then Wednesday be a collaboration day, a catch-up day, um, a meet day. And so we, we continued that through the rest of the school year. And that really lowered the anxiety level and increased the participation level with our students and, um, and our anxiety level among parents also decreased during that time compared to what it was before. The pace was just too, too, uh, too fast right at the beginning as we were just getting up and running. Um, so some other pieces, the first week of May, teachers came back in and packed up their rooms, again, in a safe social distancing, mask kind of way. Um, and then this past week, students have been dropping off, picking up items, again, transportation and special needs assistance helping tremendously in that um, secretaries, uh, nurses, counselors, um, other staff helping tremendously in that. Um, during this time, we've had a tremendous amount of staff PD just because of even though we were as ready as anybody for that, when you have to totally do a 180 on how you teach your students and the, the mediums that you're using, they need a lot of PD. So they were doing PD as they were teaching also. Um, the, pol or the classified staff, in addition to the things I mentioned earlier, they were involved in a professional development series called the Positive Learning Culture really talking about E plus R equals O, event plus R equals O. So you can't control the events, you can't control the outcome, you can only control the response, and you need to do so in a very calculated way. So um, we did 13 days of that with our classified staff. They had a very positive feedback with that. Um, Tedexo and their staff have done just a fantastic job of stepping up to the plate and providing lunches for our students and they're continuing to do so during the month of June at different locations. I think Karen mentioned it earlier at down Shrew Creek Elementary and down at our apartments. Mm -hmm. So continuing that. Um, you know, grateful for our staff for their can-do attitude and also for our parents of their can-do attitude of really taking on a whole different dynamic while trying to, to work full-time also. So Kudos to our parents and how they have just uh, just been a huge partner in this whole situation. So a big thank you to them also. Um, like I said earlier, we were, we sent out a panorama survey. I encourage people to fill out that survey. That's parents and staff and students to provide us feedback. I, I do know it's a little lengthy. You know, it's probably 20, 25 minute survey. However, if you think about some things that you have done that are maybe 20, 25 minutes that really aren't a good return on your time. Maybe playing, playing Candy Crush or Heyday or, or whatever that, you know, you please spend 20 minutes to give us feedback on, on, our, on our kids and how we're doing. And, and so we can do a better job on things. So that leads us into discussion for next year. We've touched on this a little bit, but we really... At this point, we are still in the gathering of information stage and gathering of what questions we need to ask. And so we're looking towards the ODE for some guidance and they've given some preliminary draft guidance. We're looking at other state agencies of how they are doing things. We're looking around how people are doing things around the world that are in different situations that are in similar situations but that are coming back to school and how are they handling it and what's working well, what's not working well. So as we are preparing for next year, we're as, as a staff and as a school district, we need to be looking at a wide variety of options, anywhere from 
100% online learning to a blended approach where some kids are coming to school, some kids are, are staying at home doing learning to, um, you know, who knows, there could be a huge, I was going to say a minor miracle, but this would be a huge miracle that maybe we all come back 100%. I don't see that happening, but you just never know, you know, two and a half months away how things will evolve or some combination of those. So as district administrators and district staff, we have gotten into the preliminary pieces of that, but we're going to really uh, hit into high gear in the next couple of weeks and really try to brainstorm a multitude of, of possibilities because um, the real um, challenge with all those are the details of those situations. If any of those situations, what are the details of actual implementation of? How do you get kids into school? How do you get them on the school bus when you have to stay six feet away? How do you have lunch? How do you wash your hands um, with social distancing? Um, how do you have a class that maybe is only 50%, so you only have 12 or 13 kids in a class? So those are all the kind of things that we are thinking through and, and taking seriously. We'll, we'll take directives from the state, you know, health directives, working with Green County Health Department. And so I just want people to know that we don't have answers on that yet because we're still gathering information and want to make an educated decision. But we also need to be nimble and flexible on those because we could be doing something beginning of June and by August things could be dramatically different or they could be dramatically different in December or January so we have to have something that's flexible and nimble and so um, we're gathering all that information so I don't know if there's feedback or comments about that. Yeah, Doug, I got a question. Um, do we run into increased cost? Let's just say for a moment this is I don't think will happen but let's just take worst case we're gonna go all next year uh, remote and virtual. Do we run into increased cost for the use of Google Classroom? Do we run into internet bandwidth issues? I don't think this is funneled through the school. This is probably through the teacher's own set up at their homes or whatever. But uh, most important, I guess, is there an increased cost for heavy reliance upon on all the Google tools that are available that the school district currently use if we went to a, you know, a really high, high, high usage of that? Uh, full-time for a year so for Google and Google classroom and all that that is free to us okay so that really is not gonna be an extra cost but the extra cost could possibly be is and we saw at the end of the year here of uh, students um, devices breaking or breaking down so I'm trying to replace those since there's such a higher much higher usage on those right. do that we would probably have to look Maybe at spending a little money on applications on digital applications in order to, to do some of the things that we want to do. So I know that was a budget reduction in phase four, but maybe it's a replacement of some of the things that we're already buying for and not doing those and replacing them with something else, but trying to find a, as many opportunities for that also. With that I know. question. In some of the primary yeah. grades, we're, we can't really go um, all digital. We're gonna have to figure out ways to get materials so that students can still get their fine motor skills with paper and pencil and um, those kinds of things. It doesn't, I know I remember things better when I write it down with a pen or a pencil. Yeah. Computing my keyboard, I don't remember it as well. That's right. So, yeah, no, so, yeah, I agree. So the K to five students and the lower, the lower grades you go, the more challenging it is to effectively do remote learning. I mean, it really is. The, the lower you get down just because of those kind of things, the higher grade levels have a much better likelihood for success in remote learning. Um, but it's, there still are some challenges with that. As somebody that has taken a, taken a lot of online classes myself, I've taught a lot, a lot of online classes, um, Actually, I taught my first online class about 20 years ago, if you can think of that 20 years ago. And actually, it was a blended learning kind of approach. We were teaching some at a, with us in Centerville when I was at Northmont, and then also some kids in front of me. So actually, it was kind of some of the things that we were doing we potentially could do now. Um, but just knowing that there are some some challenges with that as you, as you get down to lower things, definitely. And again, we'll, we'll could continue. I present something? Yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, I was wondering if I could present 
um, I worked with some teachers and physicians, nurses to come up with an idea for a parent choice model. Okay. Okay. So yeah. I read uh, what, we, what we came up with, um, and I want to thank the parents, teachers, friends, medical people who helped me put this together. Um, I would really like to see as a parent with younger children, um, something called the parent choice model, where we give families and teachers the choice to take the risk to do face-to-face -face or online learning. Uh, the hope is that it divides up. Some families are willing to have their kids do the face-to-face -face with precautions and social distancing, and some parents and teachers choose that they want to continue virtual online classes. So it kind of divides up the kids, gives the parents the choice um, mm -hmm. to make the classrooms smaller. The positives for this kind of a model, um, the parents get the choice between e-learning and in-person, and it giving by giving the choice, it lowers the amounts of students in the building. If students have extended health issues, or teachers, or staff, they can begin online learning and not be absent from school or lose instruction. On a hybrid schedule, many children would be rolled in daycares on their off days anyway, so they're being exposed to germs. So why not value education over childcare? Um, Belbert can designate teachers to do this, or the teachers can record their sessions or even do an, a live feed, maybe, so students can learn and be in the class with their peers if they're not actually able to be in the classroom. Um, this is there's a lot of questions about this of course it's a numbers game ideally 25 or so students per grade level wanting to do online would make it cost effective meaning if you have fourth grade and 25 students are online you'll have one teacher that can designate and do that with them yeah. Yeah. this will also um, ensure by giving a choice that Bellbrook's keeping the money for the students that will choose online school because there is a risk that they'll go to other online programs yeah. Um, students and IEPs should be in school every day if they can. If children or parents or people they live with are immunocompromised, having them come into school is not a good option. But students on IEPs, some of them, need to be in school. As a therapist, I'm now doing my sessions virtually, and it's something, but it's not ideal. The students I'm working with are at a loss, their parents are at a loss. Um, I hear from my OT and, and speech friends, they're doing the best they can, but like David was saying, they need that in person. And some of the kids I work with are stuck just with the, their fascination is with electronics anyway. So they're stuck or they're looking for me behind the electronic, if that makes sense. Oh, they want to see me and I'm not there. Um, but this isn't a choice for all students. So if students, um, so even if they do the hybrid, if that's what the school district chooses, um, I think having students with IEPs or special circumstances be able to still come in every day is important. If IEP students choose to do the online option, it would be helpful if they could schedule time once a week to come in and meet with their therapists. That hands-on learning and help and guidance is crucial this is a very vulnerable population that could fall through the cracks and we're gonna see a lot of regression. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, that definitely does. And you know, that is something that we need to take a really hard look at and, and see, um, to see if we can do that. Because I, I do think that there is a fear that some, some parents are gonna do, go to an online school and so forth. And we'd much rather have them here in our district, because first of all, I think we provide obviously a much better education than that. But yeah. also at some point then, there's a much easier transition back into our school district. Um, and there, the, the learning gaps will be a lot less if they are with our staff and, and then another whole nother school that's online. But you know, I think we need to explore every option. Um, you know, you said it is a numbers game and it is a numbers game. Yeah, mm -hmm. and it would probably have to be some type of commitment for a, a semester or a year for those those parents. Possibly, I don't know. You you know the challenge is if you have somebody at the beginning of the year, twenty five at the beginning of the year, and then by November fifteen have dropped out, and then your other classes are that much higher. So, right, trying to think through all those things and consider those things are something that um, we need to definitely consider and and think through and. 
and try to provide as much flexibility as possible. Um, because again, in my opinion, there's nothing better than being in school every day, being in remote. There's, you know, that it, it is better than like, and again, you, I don't want to put word in your mouth, but you know, it's better than, than it's, it's something. Um, but it definitely isn't better than being a person. However, um, you know, the remote learning, if that's an option for some people, um, you know, that obviously that teacher would become an expert at that and would, would be at a high level and, and that cohort and they would really get into gear and, and um, would do well. So I think that definitely is something we need to consider, take a hard look at. I like that plan. I just like it, but for two major reasons. One is that the parents are involved in making the decision, not just the school. And mm -hmm. also there's already rumblings between the IEP crowd and if they're going to accept the plan that we may have in place or if they're going to keep their kids home or if they're going to put them in a different place. This plan sounds really good to me. Involve them and help them get back. Choice is everything. When we take away our choices, it's a fear. And yeah. um, it's interesting because when I started texting, it's amazing. I realized most of my friends are um, public health uh, teachers or medical professionals. And so when I text them, I send out this big text. Okay, what would you do? 100% of teachers and parents said they want their children or to work face to face and they'd be willing to take extra precautions um, and, and to accept that there is a risk higher, a higher risk. Now right. the one of the uh one of my physician friends said something and it was just stopped me in my tracks he said if we're only considering the physical effects of this situation and not keeping children's mental health and emotional needs plus the stress on the family system in mind then we are doing our children an injustice right and whose children are these they're yeah. the parents children right 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 but i also feel like if you want to stay home because of whatever purpose, we also have to provide such a quality program right. online. Right. I like it. We should throw that around a little. Yep. We, do, do we, we definitely will. We definitely do we will. The, do we think the state might allow that? That's. <clears throat> so I talked oh. to my friend at the CDC today, and because I said, right. what is going on? And her response says, I have no idea. Because the <laughs> CDC put out, yeah. The CDC, I don't know if you guys saw it, put out guidelines yesterday that were very strict uh, and a little bit yeah. scary, honestly. But at this point, what she is telling me, what she thinks, is it's just guidelines. And at this point, it's up to the state. Um, and then right now, it's kind of up to the district unless Mike DeWine comes down with, with something else. Yeah. That's my understanding. Yeah. And again, talking with Melissa Howe and Green County Health, you know, um, there's, you know, Different counties in Ohio have, you know, are are hotbeds, and other ones are not. So that definitely is taking consideration. You know, might we might be able to do something in Greene County, where in Cuyahoga County they can't do that. So um, in that letter that we're writing, the Greene County superintendents to the uh, uh, representatives, we're asking for flexibility in this blended right. learning or digital learning counting because that was only for this year. So we were allowed to count all this remote learning as um, official hours where you, normally it's only three days that are allowed. So that has to be passed by the legislature and allow us to do this next year. But right now it's, it's not a, it's not a legal option for next year to do remote learning and for it to count. It's, it's not in the statute. So those are things that we're asking. So we're asking for that kind of flexibility for the state that we can do what's best for our community. Good. Okay. Karen, so thanks I, for your research. We'll, we'll bring that yeah, back okay. again. We'll bring, I'm sorry. Thank you, Karen. We'll bring that back in June and we'll discuss, we'll discuss yeah. that again in June. And, yeah. and as administrators, we're gonna be working on that also, along with staff. Okay. Anything else with our remote learning? All right, we're going to go to item number four on the agenda. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we're just moving along here. Yeah. Oh, no pun intended. Sorry, this is Google Meets anyway. Sorry. 
Um, this is the first time we had this agenda item. Uh, this item is to provide greater discussion of agenda items before these are brought forward for a motion and a second. So it's a, uh, some districts in Ohio do this in a separate special meeting, uh, which is often called a work session. Uh, but that requires $800 to $1,000 in additional expense to the district for each special meeting. So work sessions are not required by law in Ohio. Uh, Ohio law requires only that school boards conduct a regular meeting at least once every two months. Uh, that would be insufficient for us, but still, that's the law. Uh, this agenda item is for the benefit of not just board members to have additional discussion time, but for the community to better understand the background of the decisions and the workings of the district. So reports to the board like we've just had, uh, we're, we're gonna try to move those to the to the front of the agenda on a regular basis. As well. And uh, later on in this meeting, I'll ask for board member feedback on this item um, so we can see how our, how our pilot of this scenario is going. So looking ahead on the agenda, um, page two, number eight, new business. And for the, for the community members who may not be familiar, um, the, it's divided into three categories for uh, personnel items. A, B, and C. A is our certified and licensed staff. Uh, B is our central office staff. And C is our support staff. So looking at um, A, 8A, a, um, the first item is a resignation from Patrick Will. Uh, his note to us said that it's um, it's a personal decision, not unhappy with the scenario, but there's uncertainty with the school financial situation and he has to look out for the best interest of his family. So he's an intervention specialist. And any, uh, any questions or comments on that? Yeah. All right. That same reasoning is true for Stephanie Bukovic. Um, so we had that later on in the agenda. Our Stephen Bell li Librarian, her position is being, you know, suspended for a year. She's found a new position in Beaver Creek, and that's um, that's a big loss for us. She's it is. an outstanding um, librarian at Stephen Bell. So uh, for supplemental contracts, uh, we have that resolution in place uh, because. Uh, supplemental contracts have to be uh, offered first to our licensed employees according to our contract. And and Kevin or, or Dr. Kozad, correct me if I'm, I misstate anything here. So, so any any questions or comments on, on doing that? But that's the, that's the reason why we do that on a regular basis for the communities. Those are non-renewed every year automatically, supplemental. Thing. Right, right. Um, so yeah, this big section of the non-renewals, that's, it's not, not associated with their performance. It's just, we, that's an annual process. We don't, uh, we don't, we non-renew them and then we, we reinstate them as the time, uh, time approaches. Again, again, many are not going to be right. 85 supplemental positions are not going to be renewed. Right. Now this is a list of 70. But there are 85 that, that are not in the right. And just to clarify on that one, I know we've had need to have some discussion on that. But uh, elimination of the position means elimination of the activity. So Camp Kern, National Junior Honor Society, Junior ROTC, uh, Color Guard, uh, you know, newspaper, all those things are science fair. Those things are gone as a result of the right. list failure. Okay. Yes. Yes. Um, our psychology intern, uh, her her internship is complete, um, so it wasn't an issue of, of performance or eliminating the job. But just it is her in, intern is internship is over. And we have some. If we go to item number six, A six, um, we have some extended service days for the 2021 school year for counselors and 
for your ROTC. Uh, Dr. Kozad, can you give us a little more information about that one? Sure. So counselors, they're on teacher contracts, but they work uh, a few days after the school year and a few days before the school year. And they also, especially at the high school, um, there's somebody in the counseling office one day a week, every week during the summer. So there's, it's a different person, obviously, every week, but they take turns. So in case there's new enrollees or there's transcripts to be done or there's questions from parents or whomever, um, they, we have somebody in the counseling department once a week throughout the summer. Okay. Any questions or comments from anyone else? Okay. Then we go, go into a section of um, uh, approving teaching contracts. Um, the, uh, uh, there's a typical progression for teaching contracts. First, con first contract is typically a one year, and then off to a two, then a five, and then a continuing is uh, can be applied for. Um, so, so although it, it's not a hard and fast requirement for that or to work that way, but the um, that's that's the typical typical progression. So we have a number of folks who have applied for two year and some for five year. Do we have any continuing? Yeah, we have some uh, continuing as well. Well, I wanted to back up a little bit, Dr. Kozad, for the um, junior ROTC. Um, with our agreement with the, the Air Force, they pay part of that salary as well, right? Yeah, of our two instructors, uh, Chitwood and Gangaware, they pay half those salaries. Okay. So, yep. Okay. And then... Um, Could we ask the Air Force to give us more money? <laughs> you know anybody that works at the base? I do. <laughs> Email me that. Because, I, uh, I, I mean, it, it can't ever hurt to ask to say, hey, we either have to get rid of this program or if you can help us out. It's only temporary, hopefully. Uh, it's worth yeah. asking. Well, I haven't heard any reductions in spending on the uh, military, have we? No. Yeah. Uh, extra money. I'm not commenting. We might have a little extra money. Karen, do you, do you have a contact? That'd be great. I mean, I don't know. I, you could always ask. I don't. I, That's right. Maybe. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then the uh, approval of the substitute teachers and so forth and school nurses. That's on a, it's on a separate list uh, that's given to us uh, for item number 10. Uh, I don't know exactly how many are on that list. I didn't count it. Maybe 100? It's quite a few. Three columns on one page. It's a, yeah. Um, it's quite a few. It's probably 100 ish. Yeah. Yep. Um, and that's an annual process as well um, to approve the substitute teachers and the school nurses. And is it next year that we have to start doing that twice a year? Yep. We have to approve them twice a year. First semester and second semester. All right. Any um, any other any other questions on the section A? No. Okay. Section B goes into central office employment, uh, resignation, and leave of absence. Uh, again, the, the contracts, uh, employment contracts for this category. Is similar uh, one, two, five, and continuing um, is the is the typical typical progression on those. And then category C, uh, which is the support staff, uh, their their contracts are also a similar progression. So one, one, two, five, and continuing. And in the um, everybody should have gotten the. Uh, the hand carry associated with category C, there's a number of changes uh, that take place in there. So. Okay, going on to section D, um, we have two items in section D. 
We have the district-wide cost reductions, uh, recommend approval re resolution to proceed with the additional cost reduction measures. Uh, and that's, those are the ones that we had uh, approved in February, correct, Dr. Kozad? Correct. Okay. And so we have to do we have to do a resolution with that to um, identify the things that we're following through on, including the the uh, RIF employed uh, employees. We've got three three people who are being RIFed in that process. Have you, have you had a chance to take a look through the resolution? Do we have any questions on that? Not really any difference from what we uh, what we approved in February, except that we have names associated with it now instead of um, targeted positions. Also, in Section D, we have um, we have our policy revisions. I'm going to go through each one in sequence just to say what the what I interpreted as the key, uh, key change or reason for the change in those policies. And um, uh, I'll, I'll do kind of the play-by-play, -play, Kevin and Liming and Dr. Kozad, if you could, you know, give color commentary or additional information or correct me if I'm wrong, please. Um, um, number 1520, employment of administrators. This appears to be a regulatory change and that we have to requ requiring that we confirm the credentials of an administrator before we before we ever pay them. Questions or comments from the board members? Okay. Blended learning is a new policy, uh, number twenty three seventy dash or dot one. It's a new policy to accommodate a blended learning program that uh, remote learning like we had have used. Uh, so far this year, it looks like it's uh, an, a new policy to us, but it's, Neola has had it around for a while. Neola is the company that essentially monitors our policies for us, for regulation changes and so forth, and then gives us updates. Can yeah. you? Yeah, really this blended learning one is essentially for students that may be deficient on credits and are utilizing a, a uh, structured program that we have purchased, um, but it's for, it's just for students that are deficient in credits. Oh, okay. I, yeah. I missed that then. Yeah. All right, thank you very much. Any other questions, comments? Okay, gifted in, uh, education and identification. Um, what I what I noticed is that there's a phrase added to include the requirement of following legislated timelines. Not that not that we weren't, but that that phrase was added to further clarify the policy. Anything else? Uh, for the employment of professional staff, uh, similar, this is uh, 3120, similar to one that, I guess, was 1520, yep. they, uh, updated to specify the licensing requirements um, as compared to having only the educational requirements. So the licensing has to be in place before you can pay them. Um, 30, uh, policy 3120.04, uh, again, uh, similar to uh, the other uh, for requirements for, for being paid. Uh, it's if you're a substitute teacher in the position that you are working in requires licensing, you have to have that license in place before you can be paid. And this speaks to that you have to be approved twice a year. That's this policy also. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And then under um, 3120, again, the uh, dot 05, 
employment of personnel in summer school and adult education programs, uh, a proof of licensure is required in order to be paid. And then employment of personnel for co-curricular and extracurricular activities, the same. So uh, the licensing uh, requirement there. Uh, 4120 employment of support staff, uh, similar to one before, updated for the license requirements and not for the education requirements. And then 4120.08, the licensure requirements in there as well. The policy 4124, um, the employment contract, uh, the, the, prior, the prior policy was really just uh, pretty short to say you have to have a, pol have to have a contract in place. Uh, there's greater specificity now that's being uh, identified for employment contracts um, and for for the rehiring process for classified staff. So there are one, two, two, two as their contracts. So it's a okay. one, one year, two year, two year, two year. Okay. Yeah. And then um, policy 4162, the drug and alcohol testing of uh, commercial driver's license holders and other employees who perform safety sensitive functions. And the language was simplified a little bit through here. There's, there's a variety of changes, but it seems as if the, the gist is to um, not only identify alcohol use as uh, a controlled substance and important for the safety sensitive functions, but uh, any controlled substance. So, um, medical marijuana and so forth, which may uh, impact or impair your judgment is now also part of that. Are there other components that, that I've missed there, Dr. Cosette? David, on that, I had a question at our last meeting just to ensure, you know, Ohio has its medical marijuana laws, uh, yet, you know, at the federal level, uh, marijuana is still uh, prohibited. So right. just, just wanted some clarification that, you know, and I think it, as written, I think it make it, it, it does kind of clarify that because it says in uh, whatever it is, 4162 paragraph A, the term illegal drug, blah, 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 pursuant to federal, state, and local laws. So I think that would preclude somebody from using medical, medical marijuana and then being able to basically bust our kids around. Or, right. Uh, whatever, so. Right. Okay. So safety is safety is paramount. So I'm, I was glad to see the expansion and simplification of the language on that. But, but there's there's agreement though that with my interpretation of that that the federal uh, element in that uh, directive covers the fact that we would not have you know, because Ohio has allows medical marijuana we're not going to allow it. We don't have to allow it because of the federal stipulation there. Correct. Okay. Got it. Um, the next one had a, re a, hand, a hand carry replacement. Uh, the no, sorry, well, it was in our packets um, for the graduation requirements. Uh, we've specified an advanced diploma and a standard diploma. The state of Ohio requires 20 credits. Uh, the standard diploma now would require 22, and the advanced diploma would require 24. Uh, the valedictorian and salutatorian would um, be required to have an, uh, qualified for an advanced diploma as well. Now, David, I was reading through these and then something came to my mind. These graduation requirements have changed several times, correct? Right, right. And that, that's why this is a, this is a, yeah, this is a replacement. In fact, uh, I mean, we have... Uh, some variations that not included in here, I don't think, but um, from one year to the next uh, for our students. So Yeah, so there's probably two or three different graduation, state graduation requirements within our high schoolers right now. 
Yeah. And who is keeping track? Because I think the freshmen have different requirements than the seniors, correct? High school counselors. Oh. High school counselors and administrators are keeping track of all that. Hmm. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah, I mean, it, it can get complicated real fast, real fast. Yeah. Oh, yeah, there are the class of 2023 and beyond, so for class of 2019 through 22, there are, the, there are the specifics identified there as well. Yeah, and the, the other one that's a, a new one, this is just first read, interscholastic athletics. Essentially, with the COVID situation we've had, we have higher um, eligibility requirements in the state. So for this fall only, we are going to the OHSSA requirement that you just have to pass five classes and not have a GPA requirement. So we are, just because of the situation, we're going down to that state level just for the fall season. So that's the only change in that policy. Okay. I'm glad they did that. Yeah, and that's, and that's for next month's agenda. And that's so that, 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 last, yes, that, that athletic one, yes, it is. All right. And then we have two um, memorandums of understanding. Um, the first. Okay. First has to do with OTE, uh, the Ohio Teacher Evaluation System, and um, I'm not finding my notes on that. But um, not everyone was able to finish their um, their reviews uh, during the school year, and as a result, then um, they can. The, this memorandum of understanding is to provide an opportunity for them to be able to finish them at the beginning of next school year uh, for those who didn't want to do it remote but wanted to have their evaluation in person. So, yeah, so it's for the clarify guidance from ODE about um, because if, evalu if observations were still to be done, they would have to be done remotely. So that was allowed under ODE under their guidance. Um, and if they weren't going to finish their evaluation this year, they would have to start all the way over next year. And so um, that memorandum of understanding just clarified all the particulars that how we handled it within our school district. But the short of it is you're able to do it remotely. We did the observation remotely, finish up the evaluation. If the teacher or administrator didn't want to complete that evaluation, it would just roll over to next year. They had to do the you have to do the whole two observations, couple walkthroughs, plan. You have to do that all again next year. So we have some people who have chosen each direction, each way, as I recall. Yep. yep. All right. And then finally, um, one that uh, came in today, the memorandum of understanding for the um, second. Uh, spring supplemental payments. And Dr. Cosette, do you want to talk through on the point? Yeah, so um, obviously the spring sport um, season was canceled and spring activities. So um, obviously those folks did do a lot of work already, um, but part of that uh, season was canceled. So we asked the union to, um, th those folks that had already been paid the first supplemental so we asked the union to waive that second that second payment of that supplemental since half their since their season was canceled, but they did do some of the work already. So they uh, graciously approved that. Where is that one on the agenda, Doug? I'm sorry. Is that on the agenda someplace? That one? That was a hand carry. as an email I sent to you. Okay. No, it's not on the agenda. It's not on the hand carry agenda either. Yeah. That was yeah, they didn't come till late this afternoon, as I recall. Um, so I, I, I tucked it in under item E, number two. Yep, memorandum of understanding, yep, yep. Okay. That's where I would put it to. Now, the law uh, 
specifies that under a pandemic, we still would be obligated to uh, pay all contracts, including supplementals. And um, so I appreciate our, um, our teachers for being willing to consider not uh, receiving this second spring payment. Um, it's very gracious of them, certainly considering our financial situation right now. So um, I want to express my gratitude to them for their willingness to um, work with us through this financial crisis. Extremely appreciative, extremely. They've been very good to work with. All right, so that completes the review of items um, for, uh, for that are going to be voted on. So I will turn it back to Dr. Kozad. Oh, excuse me, I'm sorry. I'll turn it back to Kevin Liming for the Treasurer's Report. Since we're at uh, almost two hours here, can we take a five minute break? Would that be okay, Mr. Carpenter? Yes. Um, okay, so we'll be back maybe at. Um, 905, would that be okay? That'd be fine. Thank you very okay. much. Okay. 905.
really don't have anything glaring on this report. Uh, it's been included there with your agenda. Uh, do you have any questions on it or anything specifically you want me to review? And if not, uh, you know, yeah, I think the five year was a good update for us too. Mm -hmm. right. um, okay, go ahead and call the roll. Uh, okay, uh, Mrs. France. Yes. Mrs. Long. Yes. Mr. Price. Yes. Mrs. Slothman. Yes. Mr. Carpenter. Yes. Both motion passes. Okay, can I get a motion to approve the five-year forecast uh, for the beginning July 1st, 2020, as earlier reviewed in the meeting? So moved. Mrs. Long. Second. Mrs. Lofton. Any questions for Mr. Liming that you didn't get, that you've thought of since, since we discussed it earlier or any more that uh, occurred to you? Okay, go ahead and call the roll. Okay, Mrs. Long? Yes. Mr. Price? Yes. Mrs. Slothman? Yes. Mr. Carpenter? Yes. And Mrs. France? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. All right. Do we have any correspondence that came to the board? Could you clarify what this means? Um, usually it's a, a letter that's common and come to multiple persons, but it could be uh, could be something that's noteworthy that, that you wanted to share with the rest of the board members. So like some of the conversation you shared already that you had with uh, uh, teachers and friends and medical persons and so forth. Uh, if, if you had other items that fit in that category at this point in time, then that would be a fine time to talk about it. And anything of substance that you wanted to bring up we haven't talked about already? Okay. Going on to um, open communication period, we didn't have any persons uh, signed up uh, for uh, for us to call and, and chat with. Um, I did have a, a question from uh, a couple months ago, and I, uh, I'll, uh, Leonard Rack had a couple questions at a board meeting, and I'll be uh, contacting him directly. But one of his questions had to do with the Allerton Hill contract and what they do for us. And um, as Dr. Kozad talked about earlier with some of the reductions, they provided uh, communication assistance for the district, especially since after the last levy failure, um, the community said they want more communication from us. They want better communication from us. So um, uh, they wanted to have they wanted to have better communication. So we we engaged Allerton Hill in that. They've done. They worked mostly with our uh, social media. Um, they also did our quality, uh, quality scorecard for us. Um, they've also helped with press releases, particularly with things like the um, Connor Betts crisis that we had to deal with earlier and still do to a certain extent. So, um, but as of May 1st, we sent them a letter uh, to uh, terminate that contract. So, as of May 1st, um, they are moving. Uh, moving off, uh, we had to give them 30 days notice. So the end of it is, third, is the 31st of this month, but their um, their agreement with us is being canceled. Yeah, so again, those responsibilities are going to have to be divvied out among our, our existing staff members, especially the social media piece. Um, they also help us with the bridge. Um, again, just overall, overall communications plan and overall communication strategy. So those are things that are going to fall upon me and some other folks with the social media and some other folks at the bridge. So, um, you know, it's one of those moves that as we continue to have less and less people, there's more and more, we wear more and more hats uh, in a size, our, you know, district, our size, you know, 
people wear multiple hats. So that will be just one more thing that will be added. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, move on now to uh, David. David, before we move on, I, I prepared a statement I'd like to read here uh, to okay. the attendees. And so I'll use okay. this time to do that. Uh, it's my thoughts on the, the situation we're faced with and also the recent failure of the levy, which obviously precipitated this. Mm -hmm. So here we go. I'll just read this. Um, we gather here this evening in the aftermath of a catastrophe for the Bellbrook Sugar Creek school system. Due to fiscal realities, the district tragically has no choice but to move forward on implementing the cuts that were identified to the community prior to the vote. All told, some 100 positions will be affected. Teachers will lose their jobs, librarians will lose their jobs, other classified staff will lose their jobs, and 85 supplemental positions and functions will be eliminated. The supplemental activities that have been a staple of Bellbrook School culture and education for so long are now gone. Camp Kern, Model UN, National Junior Honor Society, newspaper, middle school play and musical, junior ROTC color guard, pep band, some team sports, and the list goes on. Sounds pretty bad. But not all is gloom and doom here. In spite of this recent setback, I remain optimistic for the future of our schools. Let me tell you why. Let's turn back the the recent history on the levy attempts here in the last uh, two years in, in Sugar Creek Township, or actually over the last year. In 2019, uh, 5,304 people voted on the levy, and it failed by 1,410 votes. In the most recent levy vote, 6,362 people voted, and the levy failed just by 306 votes. And as we all know, the most recent vote was unfortunately aligned perfectly with the COVID-19 pandemic as many people began to feel very real financial concerns. Right. Even so, if only 154 people out of 6,362 had voted yes instead of no, the levy would have passed. Just 154 people out of 6,362. So clearly the information, so, so excuse me, so clearly the fact-based information provided by the district and others is having a far greater influence than the negative propaganda and misinformation pushed by those that continually attack the district's teacher, administration, school board, and public education in general. Things are clearly moving in the right direction. A positive outcome to a future levy is quite promising. In the near term, however, there are severe consequences due to the levy's failure, as I outlined above, and as we've been hearing all evening long here. The 2020 and 2021 school year will begin with the cuts you've learned about and will learn more about throughout this evening. That said, much of the damage can be overcome if a levy is considered and passed in November, since the revenue will arrive in 2021, just as it would have if the recent levy had passed in April. Considering the, the dire situation our district faces due to the levy failure, I believe the district should consider an emergency levy to be placed on the ballot in November. An emergency levy, levy differs from your normal levy in that it, one, is for a fixed amount, and two, it is for a fixed period. Being a fixed period levy, this would allow the district time before the levy would expire to seek alternatives to the current near total reliance on property taxes for school funding in this district. One consideration would be to progressively shift some of our school funding and revenue from property taxes to a school income tax based on earned, let me repeat this, earned income. This could substantially reduce, I'll say that word again, reduce the tax burden on our community's elderly and those on a, fa a fixed income. Who, I really have to ask this question, who in the community would not support reducing the tax burden on our elderly and those on a fixed income while continually, continuing to adequately fund our schools? The board administration will debate and consider the best way forward for the district in light of the current fiscal situation. As was shown in the five-year forecast earlier, we're three years out from having $414,000 in the bank when we're supposed to have on the order of $3 million. 
So we are we are we are in an emergency, and because the, the state of Ohio doesn't deem you know what we faced you know uh, you know meriting a dip into the rainy day fund, we're going to have to take care of ourselves, and our schools have been devastated by the failure of this levy. Again, if 154 people had voted differently, we would be having a vastly different discussion right now. Mm -hmm. so things are moving in the right direction. It is stunning the shift in the, um, you know, the perspective of the community. It is a no brainer that this would have passed without the COVID crisis. It would have been a slam dunk, but clearly people had concerns. And, um, and there's a lot of uncertainty and the, the, the disaster, which was the voting process as it was, it's understandable that it failed. But anyhow, I turn to my fellow board members, please hear me. We need to get the levy back on the ballot in November. I would strongly advocate the emergency level a levy approach for the two reasons. It's a fixed amount. It's for a fixed period. One of the common complaints people have was our last levy and essentially all the levies we've had are permanent levies. So let's take care of that. And then as we have, you know, the concern about, you know, as, as people want to, you know, say we've got to take care of our elderly, let's do that. Let's have the discussion in the future about migrating to a uh, school income tax. And, and part and parcel to that, we, we remove property taxes while we migrate things to income taxes. Yeah. And then our elderly people, they're going to become supportive because who would not be if they're going to be paying less taxes, especially when you're on a fixed income? Right. So I invite discussion about this. Um, we should start right away. Box ticking. We have consequences coming in the fall. But you know what? If we know on November 8th or whatever it is this year that, that it passes, 1st of January is a much rosier picture. And a lot of those 85 supplemental activities, which are so valuable for the development of our young people, could potentially return. Um, so anyhow, that's my thought. I appreciate any comments y'all have, but, uh, of course I would say that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> well, I think you make a great point. Um, I'm certainly in favor of, uh, transitioning toward income tax base as compared to a property tax base. Um, particularly because of the issues with our, um, our senior citizens who, um, they may want to be supportive, but simply feel as if they, they can't from a financial perspective. I think we'll always have people who will be opposed to a property tax or an income tax, it doesn't matter, you know, because um, it's, the opposition is, is for taxes in general. But um, for those who, who do value education and who um, want to be supportive, but their financial situation simply doesn't allow it. Uh, I think that that uh, that helps helps them and helps and helps uh, the students uh, in our in our district as well. It'll take some time, I think, to appropriately socialize that that concept to people because I think that it's gonna uh, it's quite the educational curve to get over for a number of people. I agree. You know what I think is that. If, if we went the five year, I'm sorry, if we went the emergency levy route, let's say valid for five years, we've got five years to work that. Um, but uh, I think we need, to, we need to call it what it is, not just a, another levy. We need to call it an emergency levy because that's what this situation is. And we need to get moving um, to make that case to the community. The income taxes for another discussion later. Uh, but the bottom line is we need to start moving on, on this November ballot issue. Yeah. Just a quick thought. Um, I don't know if we've actually had this part of the discussion, but I believe, and, and correct me if you know the exact answer to this, Doug, but it's something like August 2nd is the filing deadline for yeah. a November ballot. So um, it is true that we need to decide something pretty quickly. Uh, yeah. Two resolutions, remember. We have to have one requesting some information from the county auditor. Then we have to get that and at the following meeting a resolution to proceed with whatever we're doing that's one thing to think about uh, the other thing is obviously uh, as kevin said an emergency levy is a limited uh like say five year time frame uh that would need to be passed and then 
somewhere before the expiration of that, a decision would have to be made. Are we renewing the emergency levy or letting that expire and trying to go for an income tax of the magnitude to cover what we passed on the emergency levy and more, and then have a property tax reduction in, you know what I'm saying? It's gotta be, uh, it almost seemed like we ha- seems like we would have to renew the emergency levy at the in- its expiration and then pass the income tax levy uh, with property tax reduction, kind of thing like that. Yeah. So and it would take ballot issues. Right, you can get, uh, you can do the income tax and a property tax reduction at the same time, same vote. Right. Yes, that can be done, yes. So that's, you know, that's, uh, that's good. Right. Again, I really wouldn't like to go down the rabbit hole of a discussion about income tax at this point. Right. We just yeah. need, we have an emergency. Let's have an emergency levy. Uh, let's get moving because uh, our, yeah. our schools are, are falling apart now. So. Yeah. Well, you know, Kevin and I can start working on that if that's the, um, uh, not a vote from the board, but a will from the board of just kind of start exploring those options because the other thing that needs to be figured out is you know what kind of levy and then is it a levy for similar millage less millage more millage or if it's an emergency levy it's for a fixed amount of money and then if that's the case what's the fixed amount of money so those are uh, those are the things that need to be figured out if we're going to go in that direction Mm -hmm. so we would either have to we, we don't have enough regular meetings between now and august 2nd to do that unless we have a special meeting or uh, you have something that you want me to, because I have to ask our bonding attorney to prepare a resolution. uh, And um, I would not have any idea, you know, if we wait till June to decide what resolution to prepare, then I have to get him to prepare it. Then we have to pass it. Then we have to pass the second one all before August 2nd. So we have a June meeting, we have a June 30th meeting, and we have a July meeting. Okay. Is the June 30th to the July meeting enough time for the um, for the county auditor to come back with uh, numbers for us? I think it would probably be a, enough time, yeah. I, that would be um, two weeks or something like that, probably. Um, close, close to it. I'm not- July meeting. July, yeah, what's our July meeting? July 9th. So about 10 or it'd be, 10. It'd only be nine days, days. Yeah. yeah. And a holiday in the middle of it. Oh, that's true. Um, we might we might have to have a special David, meeting. Uh, David Graham is pretty easy to work with. I might be able to call him. I'll, in a situation like that, I could probably call him ahead of time in June sometime and say, here's what I think we're going to be doing. Uh, we're going to pass this resolution to June 30 meeting asking this, is there any way you can have that calculation ready <laughs> so that when sure. we have that resolution, give it to you, you've got it right there. I, I think he would do that for us to get it on time. Okay. So pretty sure we, we could do it like that. All right. So we, okay. think we need to decide though, that June regular June meeting, the next meeting, what we're going to do or what, what we want me to ask David Cram to do and have right. the uh, attorney prepare. I think okay. we need to really look at how much we need to ask for in this levy because things have come up that were not up when we uh, decided on the amount of the of the failed levy. And I only see us asking for additional funds to cover everything that we've been hit with because the, yeah. the uh, normal levy that we ask for is not going to cut it we're gonna to have to have more than that so i think we need to really think about that sure do we have to take any kind of motion this evening to get things moving along um or is this just uh we'll be prepared for it at the next meeting um and have a discussion decide what type of levy how much etc yeah we don't we don't have, we don't make the motion now. We have to do some exploration. Okay. And we really wouldn't even make a motion at the June meeting either because the motion would be on the two resolutions that I have a bond and attorney prepare for me. And I don't, 
I won't know what to put in that resolution until we have that until we decide at the June meeting. I mean, it could be put in a resolution in June, but it's not a requirement to do that. As long as there's time. I mean, I mean, if obviously, if we're putting the resolutions forward, we're making our commitment to the community. We're going to do this. It gives us time for the messaging and the education, which is so critical to this. Anyone that's informed, it's one thing if you don't have enough money. It's quite another if you're just not informed enough to understand the nature of school funding in Ohio and understand that you have to pass levies on a recurring basis because the state does not increase our funding. Our, our levy income is locked in by House Bill 920. And so until if people don't understand that, honestly, they shouldn't be voting. Be an informed voter. If you can't afford it, don't vote for it. But if you're ignorant, get, get some education. So uh, let's put it bluntly. Yeah. yeah. You know what I'm wondering? I don't really know enough about an emergency levy, but so much time was spent in education and communication with the community to discuss about millage in this last levy. And then now we have to turn it to explore the emergency levy. Would that be confusing and overwhelming? I don't think so. I think people understand when they hear the word emergency, that gets their attention. And that's what this is. It's nothing short of an emergency. I mean, think about this. 85 you know, supplemental programs are gone. This is stunning. This is unbelievable to me. Um, but that's the reality we're faced with and what we on the board have to vote to tonight because this is the budget that we have. So uh, it, we got to call it like it is. It's an emergency. And let's, that's my opinion uh, and move forward. Well, Kevin and I, Kevin Liming and I can put together some information and, and be ready to present at the next board meeting. If that's, if that's acceptable to the board. Yeah, that would be great. Okay. Karen? Mm -hmm. Okay. Virginia? Yeah, maybe Kevin would want to be in on that meeting with um, Doug and Kevin. That's fine. Okay. Sure. Yeah. I'm yeah. rather passionate about this, as you might tell. So, uh, yeah. And I appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> that would be fine. You definitely right. did. Any other? Uh, oh, Mr. Price, you, you had more than three minutes, but you know you don't have a limit on that. So thank yeah, you very much. Like, what the benefit. <laughs> Perk. Thank you very much. OK. Um, uh, superintendent's report. I think, I, I think I've lost control. I'm not sure that I had it. But that's our, <laughs> all right, I had. All right, we're moving right along here with number eight. Um, <laughs> new business: certified license, staff employment, resignation, leave of absence, supplemental duty. Recommend acceptance of res resignation from intervention specialist Patrick Will, effective at the end of the 2019-20 school year. So moved, Mary. Second, David. Any other any other comments? The sorry to see him go. I know he was a newer teacher, but um, was uh, excellent teacher, and just will be will be missed here. Um, again, that's one of the unfortunate ramifications in the financial situation that we're in. We're, we're losing good people, so good luck yeah. to him. Yep, yeah, absolutely. Mr. Lemon, you want to call the roll? Okay, Mr. Price? Yes. Mrs. Sloffman? Yes. Mr. Carpenter? Regretfully, yes. Mrs. France? Yes. And Mrs. Long? Yes. Motion passes. Supplemental duty, other be resolved. The Bellbrookshire Creek of Education has offered these supplemental duty positions via posting to licensed employees of the district. The board either had no qualified licensed employee applicants or no employees applied for before these positions were offered to non-licensed persons. The following non-licensed persons have met qualifications for the board posting and supplemental duty positions as noted below. Recommend approval of the following supplemental duty contract effective of the 2019-20 school year. John Venters, high school assistant baseball, 75%. Uh, Mrs. Long, second from Mrs. Sloffman. Sure. Any other discussion? 
All right, Mr. Ryman, call the roll. Mrs. Slothman? Yes. Mr. Carpenter? Yes. Mrs. France? Yes. Mrs. Long? Yes. Mr. Price? Yes. Motion passes. Recommend non-renewal of supplement on duty contracts at the conclusion of the 1920 school year for the following non-teacher employees. I'll read for, through each one of these. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there's quite a few here. I'm not reading through them. Richard Anderson through Sarah Wolf. Little, little levity. <laughs> <laughs> okay, from Mary. Yes. Second. Second. Mrs. Lofman. Any other? Any further discussion? All right, Mr. Lyman, please call the roll. Mr. Carpenter? Yes. Mrs. France? Yes. Mrs. Long? Yes. Mr. Price? Yes. Mrs. Slothman? Yes. Motion passes. Uh, just, uh, just to comment this, this was one, I knew that, that somebody had contacted me about this. They had seen this list and thought that this was the list of 85 and that these, these were all the people who were um, whose supplemental roles were going to be eliminated. So I assured them that that wasn't the case. It was there was a mix of some uh, in each category. Yeah, these are not our notes for 2019-20. Everything else is going to be 2021. Right. Yeah. Number five, recommend non-renewal of the following employment contracts at the conclusion of the 1920 school year. Allison Jamison, our psychology intern. Any in motion? So moved. Mrs. Hoffman? Second. Mrs. Long? Any further discussion? Good luck to her. She has a job at Dayton Public, so. Oh, good for her. Time job, yep. All right, Mr. Liming. Okay, Mrs. France. Yes. Mrs. Long. Yes. Mr. Price. Yes. Mrs. Slothman. Yes. And Mr. Carpenter. Yes. Motion passes. Number six: Recommend approve the following licensed staff extended service days for 2021 school year. Shelly Benson, Christine Gangaware, Andrew Hartley, Gene Johnson, Deborah Sanderman, and Chris Scully. Give a motion. So moved. Mrs. France. Second. Mrs. Long. Any other discussion? All right, call the roll, please. Mrs. Long. Yes. Mr. Price. Yes. Mrs. Slothman. Yes. Mr. Carpenter? Yes. And Mrs. France? Yes. Motion passes. Recommend approval of the following licensed two year teaching contracts uh, for 2021 Christine Gangware and Emma Tompkins. So Motion. Moved. Mrs. Slothman? Second. Mrs. France? Any further discussion? Okay, call the roll, please. Mr. Price? Yes. Mrs. Slothman? Yes. Mr. Carpenter? Yes. Mrs. France? Yes. Mrs. Long? Yes. Motion passes. Recommend approval of the following license five year teacher contracts effective 2021 school year. Lisa Bakita, all the way to Andrew Solomon. Have a motion. So moved. Uh, Mrs. Long. Second. Mrs. Slothman. Any further discussion? All right, please call the roll. Mrs. Slothman? Yes. Mr. Carpenter? Yes. Mrs. France? Yes. Mrs. Long? Yes. And Mr. Price? <laughs> yes. Ten <laughs> late. <laughs> <laughs> recommend approval of number nine. You recommend approval of the following continuing teacher contracts effective with the 2021 school year. Mark Carrera, Emily Klein, Kyle Ferguson, Heather Hebrink, Jeff Jenkins, Lindsay Seaman Thompson, and Benita Tagger. So moved. 
This is France. Second. This is Long. Any discussion on the continuings? Okay, Mr. Mr. Liming. Mr. Carpenter. Yes. Mrs. France. Yes. Mrs. Long. Yes. Mr. Price. Yes. Mrs. Slotman. Yes. Motion passed. Recommend approval of substitute teachers and nurses for the 2021 school year. And again, there's a long list of about a hundred or so in your packet. Yeah. We have a motion. To move. Oh, to move. Was that Mary first? No. no. Ginger. Okay, Mrs. Hoffman, and then Mrs. Long. And then Karen. Okay. <laughs> I think. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you got it. Way around. It wasn't me. Sometimes with a little bit of delay, I can't tell who's whose mouth moves first. So. <laughs> Are there any further discussion yeah. along this? No. Okay, Mr. Liming. Okay, Mrs. France. Yes. Mrs. Long. Yes. Mr. Price. Yes. Mrs. Slothman? Yes. Mr. Carpenter? Yes. Motion passes. B, Central Office Employment Resignation Leave of Absence. Recommend approve the following Central Office, and Central Office Employment Contracts effective the 2021 school year. Jessica Kane, Jennifer Dreischarf, Stephanie Eben, and Beverly Wetzel. The move. That Mrs. Long? Okay. Yes. And I'll second Mary. Mary, Mrs. Franz. Any any further discussion? Okay, Mr. Liming. Mrs. Long. Yes. Mr. Price. Yes. Mrs. Slothman. Yes. Mr. Carpenter. Yes. Mrs. Franz. Yes. Motion passes. C, support staff employment resignation leave absence. Recommend acceptance of the following resignation at the end of the 1920 school year. So this is on your hand carry also. Um, we added a, an individual, so it should be Cynthia Collins, Richard Moore, and Stephanie Vukovic. We have a motion? So moved. From Mrs. Slothman. I'll second it. Good. Thank you. <laughs> Any other discussion? <clears throat> I just have the comment that, again, um, we're going to miss our library specialists so very much, Mrs. Rinkovich. Yep, losing quality people, exactly. unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Liming. OK, Mr. Price. Yes. Mrs. Slothman. Yes. Mr. Carpenter? Yes. Mrs. France? Yes. Mrs. Long? Yes. And Mr. Mr. Moore is retiring, which is nice that it's that, that choice for him. And Cynthia Collins is moving to um, a substitute position, so she's still staying, still staying right. with So that's good for all right. three of those folks. So, good, good people. Number two here is also a hand carry at two people add. So, recommend approve the following one year support staff contracts effective for 2021 year Roderick Adler, Bronson Perry, George Fisher, and Dina Harper. So moved. Mr. Aaron. Second, I'll do it, Mr. Carpenter. And just, further, just some further clarification on this. So for uh, George, Ron Fisher, and Dina Harper, they're actually um, part of the four bus drivers that would have been reduced, but per our contract, we have an opening in our special needs assistant. So they're being involuntary transferred from their transportation job to the special needs job, and that bus driver position will not be filled. 
So, okay. yeah. So just further clarify on that. Mm -hmm. All right, Mr. Lyman. Okay, Mrs. Slothman. Yes. Mr. Carpenter. Yes. Mrs. France. Yes. Mrs. Long. Yes. And Mr. Price. Yes. Motion passes. All right, number three. Recommend approve the following two-year support staff contracts effective of the 2021 school year. Deborah Bailey is on there. She needs to be crossed off. So please cross off Deborah Bailey. All right. So for this, it should be Laura Layton, Lori Naughton, Nicole Stewart, and Danielle Waitsby. Just the four of them. Okay. And so Mrs. Franz? Yes. Second, Karen. Mrs. Long? Any other discussion? All right, Mr. Liming. Mr. Carpenter? Yes. Mrs. France? Yes. Mrs. Long? Yes. Mr. Price? Yes, sorry. Mm -hmm. I did. <laughs> and Mrs. Slothman? <laughs> yes. And motion passes. Recommend for the following continuing support staff contracts effective the 2021 school year. Tom Brixey all the way down to Amy Rodenroth. So moved. So moved. Oh. I'm Mrs. Loffman and then Mrs. Long. Second. Any other further discussion? All right. Please call the roll. Mrs. France? Yes. Mrs. Long? Yes. Mr. Price? Yes. Mrs. Slothman? Yes. Mr. Carpenter? Yes. <laughs> passes. Recommend approval of substitute support staff for 2021 school year. That's on the hand carry, Cynthia Collins. Motion, please. And Sorry. there's actually a whole, there's a list also. I'm sorry, Cynthia Collins, and then there's a whole list of substitute support staff in your packet. Yeah, the gold, the gold sheet. Yeah. Looks like there's 60 people on that list. Is there a motion? So moved. Ms. Loughman. Second, Karen. This is long. Any further discussion? All right, Mr. Liming. Mrs. Long. Yes. Mr. Price? Yes. Mrs. Slothman? Yes. Mr. Carpenter? Yes. Mrs. France? Yes. Motion passes. All right, number D is actually, you're on your hand carry district-wide cost reductions. So that's your new number D. Okay. Board policy will be E and then so forth. So D here, district-wide cost reductions. Recommend approval of resolution to proceed with additional cost reduction measures, including student busing and staff reduction in force, effective with the 2021 school year. And as soon as we get a first and second, I'll, I'll read the resolution then. Okay. So moved. Karen. And second. This is Slotman. Okay, so here's the resolution to proceed with additional cost reductions. Whereas on February 13th, 2020, upon consideration of the recommendation of the superintendent, the present, present level of funding from federal, state, and local resources, and the needs of students in the community, the Board of Education approved specific steps to further decrease district expenses, expenses contingent upon the outcome of a local tax levy measure. Whereas on May 19, 2020, the Greene County Board of Elections certified the failure of the March 2020 levy ballot measure. Whereas additional financial savings can be attained for the district through the elimination of transportation services for students in grades three to through eight who live within a two mile radius of the school building in which they attend, along with an elimination of all high school busing, which is in accordance with section 3327.01 of the Ohio Revised Code. Whereas additional financial savings can be attained through the elimination of a 712 social studies position and the reorganization of the 712 science position. And whereas pursuant to the Ohio Revised Code, sections 3319.17 and 3319.172, 
along with corresponding provisions of the collective bargaining agreements applicable to certified and classified personnel, the board is authorized to reduce its force due to lack of funds and financial difficulties. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Education for Belmont Sugar Creek Local School District finds it necessary to eliminate transportation services to grades three through eight students who live within a two mile radius of the building in which they attend and to eliminate all high school busing beginning with the 2021 school year. Be it further resolved that the board hereby suspends and or non-renews the employment contracts of the following bus drivers for the 2021 school year pursuant to reduction of force. And that is Deborah Bailey. Be it further resolved that the board of hereby suspends and or non-renews the employment contracts of the following certified personnel for the 2021 school year pursuant to a reduction in force, and that is Aaron Darris and Kara Heller. Be it further resolved that the board hereby authorizes and directs the superintendent to notify parents of the busing changes and to notify the affected district personnel that their employment contracts will be suspended and or non-renewed for the 2021 school year pursuant to reduction of force. The reason for the reduction, the effective date, and the pervert and further to provide such individuals with notice of their rights of reinstatement from such layoff, be it further resolved that it's hereby found and determined that all formal action the board concerning and or relating to the adoption of this resolution was taken in an open meeting of this board and that all deliberations of this board and any of its committees that result in such formal actions were in meetings open to the public and in compliance with all legal requirements, including section 121.22 of the Ohio Revised Code. All right, any further discussion? All right, Ms. Trudeau. Hey, Mr. Price? Yes. Mrs. Slothman? Yes. Mr. Carpenter? Yes. Mrs. France? Regretfully, yes. Yes. And Mr. Long? Yes. Motion passes. Again, those staff members will be missed. They're quality staff members and just a, a real difficult Difficult situation. Mm -hmm. um, e is now board policy, and those were reviewed earlier in the meeting. I'm sorry. Yep, board policy. Recommend approval of the following board policies all the way from 1520 to 6107. So, um, go ahead, Mrs. France, and I'll second it. We went through those one by one. Does anybody have any go backs that they want to uh, comment on or just or ask questions about? All right, Mr. Liming. Mrs. Slothman? Yes. Mr. Carpenter? Yes. Mrs. France? Yes. Mrs. Long? Yes. Mr. Pride? Yes. Motion passes. And um, for those who might still be hanging on to listen to us, uh, <laughs> the, um, the board policies are all available on the school website. So um, they're, they're always accessible there and the updates will be, uh, will be made and, and posted to there sometime in the very near future. I don't know what the timing is on that. Um, this in is the near, near future, yeah. Yeah, Sheila Woody gets these things taken care of quite quickly. So. All right, All right, thank you. The new F is Memorandum of Understanding. There's a one and two. So number one, recommend approve the following Memorandum of Understanding between the Bellbrook Sugar Creek Board of Education and the Sugar Creek Education Association mm -hmm. regarding certified teacher evaluations. I have a motion. So moved. Mrs. is Second. Second. This is Long. Any further qu questions or comments? All right, Mr. Liming. Mr. Carpenter. Yes. Mrs. France. Yes. Mrs. Long. Yes. Mr. Price. Yes. Mrs. Slothman. Yes. Motion passes. And the second one, there is a number two on here. Um, hold on one second here. Let me get my paperwork. Um, memorandum of understanding, um, and this is in regards to um, 
elimination of the second payment for spring supplementals and activities. So those folks have been paid 50% already. And this MOU was to eliminate that second payment. We have a motion. So moved. This is France. We have a second. Second, Karen. This is Long. Again, I just want to, and it was already said earlier, I just want to say thank you very much um, to the SEA or, or certified union. Um, they have been extremely good to work with, understanding, and, and again, in a tough situation, professional. Um, they get the big picture, and just these are not easy decisions, not easy things to do. Um, but unfortunately, that's where we're at financially in the school district, and just um, to know that they're willing also to, to make those hard decisions is extremely beneficial. Again, they they get the big picture and that they truly are in it for the right reasons and in it for the kids and just um, truly appreciative of them. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yes. You know, certainly during the, during the crisis when a number of people are taking salary reductions and or other um, uh, pay cuts. Um, this is certainly appreciated uh, their willingness to step up and do this for us. They could have made the situation very difficult and they've they have been very cooperative and that's that's fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. Any other comments? All right, Mr. Lyman. Mrs. France? Yes. Mrs. Long? Yes. Mrs. Price? Yes. Mrs. Slothman? Yes. And Mr. Carpenter? Yes. Motion passes. With our gratitude. So, items information discussion. This is the new number G. Uh, revisions to board policy. I mentioned that earlier. The interscholastic athletics, that's essentially the um, um, for the fall sports eligibility is now five classes and no GPA just for the fall classes. Mm -hmm. That goes down to kind of the OHSSA minimum guidelines. We've always had more than that, but given the situation, we are we're doing that. That will be on for next time. Second semester bullying reports. And um, so again, these are these are incidents that have been reported, and we have investigated them fully. And and um, have addressed those situations. So Stephen Bell, we had zero. Bell Creek four. Middle school thirteen, and the high school zero. That's the second semester. Um, and then number three, you're under items of information discussion. Congratulations, to the class of 2020. Last Saturday, we held a um, semi-virtual but in-person uh, family by family. Again, social distancing. Um, each family came in, the student came in on one side of the high school auditorium, the parents came in on the other, parents gave them, gave their child their, their diploma, it was being recorded, it was being live streamed, everybody extremely appreciative, uh, Dave Han, um, who's the high school principal and his staff just did a fantastic job <laughs> of, of trying to make the best out of a uh, tough situation, especially with the seniors where they missed the prom and graduation and 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 just those last days of their high school career so kudos to them for that yeah i i was there to visit part for there for part of the day and it worked like clockwork it seemed so yeah, yeah. it was very good number well, four it was really cool our family went oh i'm sorry go ahead <laughs> we went biking just to pass by it and i kind of expected it to be sort of a sounds weird but like a discipline because it's not what it's supposed to be but there was families out taking pictures by their their names and their poster boards out there and they were excited and having little tailgate stuff and it was just very heartwarming to see that yes. they were having truly beautiful moments together yeah trying to make the best out of situations that yeah mm -hmm. and then all, all the signs along the, in front of the schools that was awesome yeah yeah very cool Number four here, school calendar for next year. I'm just going to throw this out here as we continue to look for next year. Um, 
you know, we've gone anywhere from in my head and I've talked with other people, other superintendents and other administrators, teachers, friends, whatever. We've gone anywhere from keeping our, our beginning date the way it is um, to moving it back to moving it up um, just to either a try to have a little bit more guidance and time before the school starts. The negative of that is then if something hits in the middle of the year, then you've you've pushed your stuff back and you've given your no, no self. You've really given yourself no flexibility in the middle of the year. So I just want you to continue to think about that. We can bring that up again in June. I'm under the uh, I've gone all over the place with this back and forth. I'm, I'm kind of thinking we need to stay where we're at at this point. We're pretty early compared to everybody else anyways. Um, and so we can discuss again in June. Again, I think we need to make a decision no later in June. Of we're going to do something. Um, but at this point, I'm kind of staying where we're at with the date. But we can discuss again in June. Or if you have any thoughts, you can let me know now or, or in a follow-up or whenever. Like I on that, one thought is that, you know, I think we're more certain to be uncertain, you know, <laughs> sooner. Because – yeah, we are certainly dealing with problems right now, and I think the way the state has been doing things, you know, they may like slow roll it on us, and we don't know anything till the first of August, fifth of August, tenth of August, because so many schools are starting later in the month. And so, predicting that we're going to have a problem on top of a problem later in the year is maybe, you know, I'm not God here, but maybe a little less likely than we might almost certainly have some lack of clarity implementation in terms of procedures, you know, how people are going to enter the school and distancing if we are going to go to school. So I might want to think about slipping in a bit, a week, two, whatever. I don't know. But I just think the more time we have to figure out what the government's going to do in this state and then for us to be able to have time to put the procedures in place to accommodate that guidance, I think, because it just seems like we're starting really early. I mean, I don't know. But August, thir August 13th, right? That is – yeah, really early. for kids, August 10th for staff. Yeah. Yeah. So that this seems tremendously early to me uh, by American, by American standards. Anyhow. So, um, yeah. So. And the reason why we, what few of the reasons why we've been starting that early the past, probably three or four years or so is to try to get the first semester done before leaving for yeah. winter break. Yeah. So high school exams and everything else. And there's second quarter is done. So when you yeah. come back, there's not that, yeah. you know, still finishing up second quarter thing, but that does force you to have to start early. No, that's so good. I, I, I think it's a really discussion to think about. Okay. One other thing to think about concerning that, uh, our first pay for teachers is set now for September 4th, and we are not allowed to pay teachers for two weeks unless they work two weeks. So if we back the start of school up, let's say, you know, a week or two later, then they will not have worked two weeks and we'll have to go three weeks or so between paychecks for teachers instead of two. Yeah. That happens yeah. every seven years or so anyway, but yeah, there's always yeah. repercussions. Yeah. They have to be considered. That's, I just right. thrown another consideration. in yep. here, So and again, just because the students aren't coming back, doesn't mean the teachers aren't coming back and trying yeah. to, you know, do some PD and get some things figured out too. So just because if we're talking about kids coming back later, it doesn't necessarily mean the teachers are coming back later. They could be coming back at the same time. Again, we're over on our minimum hours compared to the state, so we have some flexibility with that. Okay. Okay. Um, I think that's it for my part here. All right. Uh, the next item is executive session to consider the employment dismissal compensation of a licensed public employee per revised code 121.22 paragraph G1. So motion. moved. So Mrs. moved. Second. Mrs. Slotman. All right, Mr. Lyman, call the roll. Ms. McLaurin? Yes. Mr. Pride? Yes. Mrs. Slothman? Yes. Mr. Carpenter? Yes. Mrs. France? Yes. Motion passes. We're going into executive session at uh, 10 p.m. Uh, logistically, we are going to um, drop off of this uh, Google Meets and go on to a separate one 
And for those who are still with us and wanting to see the motion for adjournment, we'll be back in this meeting, as I recall. A quick question. Do I need to be in on this executive session or do I get a freedom to uh, head east? <laughs> um, you need to be in on it. Okay. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> We'll enjoy it and we'll enjoy your smiling face. All right. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you on the executive session meeting. Okay. Please, please make sure that you log off of this one.
We are adjourned. Thank you all very, very much. Yay. It's been.